Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. October 8th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Heather Parton, columnist at Salon, Proprietor of the blog Hullabaloo, you may know her as Digby. Also on the program today, Ms. Judy Gold, comedian, author, philosopher, sometimes, sometimes yeller. <laughs> She'll be joining us today. Meanwhile, the Senate passes a two month debt limit extension. And Chuck Schumer, so victorious. <laughs> Never seen anybody celebrate a punt in quite that way. And despite punishing the unemployed by removing unemployment benefits, jobs growth is still anemic. Pfizer is seeking FDA authorization for the use of its vaccination for five to 11 year olds. And some Texas abortion clinics resume abortion services after a federal judge halts the Texas abortion ban. Trump aides defy January 6th commission subpoenas remains to be seen. Democrats will insist that subpoenas mean something. Biden administration reinstates the federal climate adaptation and resilience reports. Spoiler alert, bleak. 44% of Republicans, speaking of bleak, want Trump in 2024. I can assure you it'll take about 15 minutes for that number to get up closer to 75, 80% of Republicans once that campaign starts. Meanwhile, Biden also uses executive authority to restore environmental protection to three national monuments and at least 100 people dead or injured in Afghanistan as a, bom as a mosque is bombed. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is Friday. The week has just flown by. And, uh, and particularly for Emma, uh, because uh, she is off today. So uh, she's gone. Um, doing the solo, of course, uh, Matt and Bradley are here. And uh, all of you are here, and I appreciate your, your coming uh, today. Um, we got a couple of things uh, to, to discuss, obviously. Um, this is... <laughs> I guess we should just play this um, uh, Chuck Schumer thing. Like, you know, the, 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 the controversy and frankly, the existence of the debt ceiling has now reached such farcical levels that it, it, it is stunning. And what is really, um, I, I guess, upsetting about this is that the Democratic Party, the Democratic leadership, seems to think this is some type of winning political issue for them. I can't tell if it's just a desperate desire not to talk about the reconciliation bill or what, but this is just, it is absurd. It is absurd. And 
there were uh, four major things that the Democrats had to do in the month of September. Passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, passed the reconciliation, the budget bill, passed a continuing resolution for the budget so that there isn't a government shutdown, and pass a hike on the debt ceiling or eliminate the debt ceiling for that matter. They punted three of those. I mean, in other words, nothing got done. Everything was just put off in some way. And I am completely aware of, and I think everyone is, for the most part, who, who follows politics, of the obstructions here and the obstacles. The Republicans, Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, Josh Gottheimer. None of this was not predictable or predicted. I mean, we're sitting here in a closet in Brooklyn and we could see this coming from a mile away. Mile away, we could see it coming from 25 miles away, 30 miles away. And it doesn't seem like there was any plan for any of this. Apparently, Chuck Schumer knew that the Joe Manchin's number was $1.5 in, in June or July. Does he have, like, avoidance anxiety or something? Just it, didn't want to deal with it? Well, and here is, like, and this is the thing that, you know, I don't care if Chuck Schumer goes up there and, and throws um, a garbage at, at any of those Republicans. I mean, literally. But there seems to be a disconnect as to, you know, the sort of the the value of certain political victories and the value of certain political victories that um, permeates the uh, the Democratic leadership. Here is Chuck Schumer slamming Republicans for uh, playing with the debt ceiling because they're being hypocritical. Clip number two. Now, Mr. President, in a few moments, the Senate will pass an extension of the debt limit through early December, avoiding a first ever Republican manufactured default on the national debt. On Monday morning, I said we needed to pass a bill to address the debt limit by the end of the week, and that is exactly what we did. Republicans played a dangerous and risky partisan game. And I am glad that their brinksmanship did not work. For the good of America's families, for the good of our economy, Republicans must recognize in the future they should, that they should approach fixing the debt limit in a bipartisan way. What is needed now is a long-term solution so we don't go through this risky drama every few months. And we hope Republicans will join in enacting a long-term solution to the debt limit in December. We're ready to work with them. Leader McConnell and Senate Republicans insisted they wanted a solution to the debt ceiling, but said Democrats must raise it alone by going through a drawn out, convoluted, and risky reconciliation process. That was simply unacceptable to my caucus. And yesterday, Senate Republicans you can see Joe Manchin putting his hands in his head. I don't know why he does that other than like, I, I, I can't, <coughs> I, I can't wish enough exhaustion <coughs> on Joe Manchin. But Chuck Schumer's up there, you know, sort of um, uh, doing a victory lap. I said we'd get this done and we got it done. Well, <laughs> you didn't get it done. You just put it off by two months. And you're out there still pushing this notion of like, I mean, has since the moment that Joe Biden announced that they were going to get bipartisan with all of this stuff, his numbers have fallen precipitously with independence in a way that like, it's almost hard to understand how they could have fallen more. Like there, there, it seems that whatever he did was the exact opposite of what should be done. Now, part of that undoubtedly was a function of missing the vaccine mark. And I think probably more so just 
the the resurgence of Delta, which I did, obviously couldn't do anything about. But the reaction to all of this, the slowing down of the agenda after the, um, the, the COVID bill, this laser-like focus on the bipartisan nature of the process that the, the Republicans are not playing along with. Every single time Chuck Schumer complains about the Republicans refusing to play nice and be bipartisan in passing this, he is announcing to the American public that he is incompetent. He is announcing to the American public that if you put Democrats in charge, we're going to have these type of problems. It's like you want your football team to win a game and then they announce it. We got a victory to announce. We got a deal to keep the lights on this Sunday. It's it, 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 but it, but it, every time he talks about complains about the Republicans bullying him, which is what he's doing. He is announcing to the American public who don't pay attention to any of the details. Just that, like, we can only do so much to protect you. On one hand, I'm announcing to you that the Republicans are a fundamental threat. A fundamental threat to your ability to go to work tomorrow and cash your checks. And on the other hand, I'm just telling you, like, we're barely holding on here. Well, wait a second. I think I'll choose the option where we're not barely holding on. They, they, they have to start coming up with a different take here that doesn't involve, we barely got by how big, how big and bullying these people are. You're not going to, I mean, never mind all the policy implications, <laughs> but as a political matter, you're not going to convince anybody by telling them that we're just hanging on by the skin of our teeth because these these Republicans are almost too much for us to handle. That's just not going to cut it. And, and somehow, uh, you know, Chuck Schumer's up there thinking like, nailed it, nailed it. All right, we got to take a quick break. We'll be back with Heather Parton after this. Folks, a couple of uh, sponsors of today's program. I really feel like I uh, I need some of this right now. SunsetLakeCBD.com, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one of our movement sponsors, they have uh, great politics. They have great uh, business practices, $15 minimum wage, mostly employee-owned company. Perhaps from the perspective of their SEBAD, they have great agricultural um, practices, integrated pest management, no pesticides, organic fertilizer, regenerative uh, agriculture practices in conjunction with the University of Vermont. You can go on their website, get a breakdown analysis of exactly what is in every single one of their products. The tinctures comes in multiple um, concentrations of CBD. 3,000 meg, 750 meg. They have some with melatonin in it. They have um, gummies that are delicious. They have fudge. They have coffee that is um, roasted with Sebede. They have Arnica uh, and uh, Sebede uh, Solve. Great for your muscles. They have hand lotions. Um, all sorts of great products. We get a tremendous amount of positive feedback. They have smokables. Matt's sitting there um, sniffing his keef. Got a whole ounce of keef here. An ounce of keef. People know what that means. And that's a, it's nice. Nice to cut in with uh, your other smokables. Um, we get really great feedback uh, um, for our um, partnering with sunsetlakecbd.com. Uh, so check it out. Left is best. Left is best. Gets you 20% off. Use the coupon code left is best. One word, left is best. 20% off. Check it out right now. Uh, appreciate their sponsorship. Really do. Also, um, yeah, I don't know if I want to. I'll do that. Um, this one's sort of like a movement uh, sponsor. 
<laughs> oh, Emma's glad she missed this. Uh, it's Tushy. The modern bidet that attaches directly to your toilet in under 10 minutes. And it's true, actually. That is a... Um, there are two things that I hear back from people uh, about uh, Tushy. One is they are... Well, three things, I guess. One is they're amazed at how um, inexpensive it is, particularly relative to a, a full-on bidet. Two, how easy it is to install. And three, they love it. They absolutely love it. Um, I went uh, bidet, never looked back, add to the pun, um, after that. And you don't have to for the most part. Because it washes your uh, your butt with a clean stream of water. You poop, you wash, you pat your eye. Tushy bidet washes your bum with water for better clean than toilet paper. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, washing with water, less irritating. Also, more effective. Tushy bidet is easy to install and attaches to your toilet. Like I say, in under 10 minutes, there is no electricity or plumbing needed. Using a Tushy bidet reduces your toilet paper use by 80%, and that, of course, as you know, saves you money. And frankly, a headache. It is eco-friendly, and it is stylish. Start washing with a Tushy bidet for a better clean. Go to hellotushy.com slash majority to get 10% off plus free shipping. Special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash majority for 10% off. After you buy and install your Tushy, show it off. Tag at Hello Tushy on Instagram. All right. I want to welcome back to the program with a, um, a frequent guest on this program over the years, over the really over, over well over a decade. So much so that uh, we even have something like this. Are you ready for some TV? There you go. Her own, uh, her own uh, song-based uh, introduction. Heather Parton, Digby, uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for joining. Um, thanks for having me, Sam. Happy Friday. Happy Friday uh, to you, uh, Heather. All right, let's. Um, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Obviously, we got to talk about the the, the debt ceiling and. Um, uh, Kristen Cinema. She had some very, very difficult times this week. Uh, very difficult times. Um, yeah. uh, but I also want to touch on this Senate report, which I think has gotten not that much attention in terms of the January sixth thing. We also have uh, what's going on down in Texas. But um, let's just start with the debt ceiling. I, I, I uh, we just played a clip of Chuck Schumer. Um, really handing it to the Republicans uh, rhetorically. And, you know, apparently this upset the Republicans, but who cares? Um, you know, their behavior is sort of fixed behavior anyways. Um, and it's just something for them to cry about. But what, what bothers me more about it is it is sort of an indication that Chuck Schumer thinks that this is has any value whatsoever, <laughs> everything that's happened, like a fundamental misunderstanding that... The, this is just all, it's just all bleeding, essentially, of uh, Democratic support. Well, I mean, this is, you know, and part of the, the issue here is that, you know, the, the Republicans are running one of their standard hissy fits, right? I mean, this is the same thing that happened with Kirsten Cinema earlier in the week. They're all just sitting there going, oh, you know. Bring me my smelling salts. You know, I can't. This is terrible. This behavior. It's just so uncivil. And, you know, needless to say, coming from the party of Donald Trump, that's just a little bit rich. And you're absolutely right. The Democrats should not care about this. And it should not be an issue. They shouldn't care. Chuck Schubert can say what he wants. I assume he, you know, as a human being, was frustrated by what had gone down during the week. And he said what he said, and Joe Manchin sat in the background with his head in his hands going, oh, this is so terrible and whatever. But, you know, fundamentally, the fact that Schumer felt the need to say this 
as a, you know, whether or not it was a human reaction or not, uh, says exactly what you were, you're referring to, which is that he is, you know, he, I don't know that they're getting it. You know, this isn't a matter of, you know, calling out Republican hypocrisy is a meaningless exercise. Shamelessness is their superpower. It doesn't mean anything. Actions speak louder than words. And you just you just do it, you plow through it, you get it done, and that's it. And you get you cannot even think about it. And the media too, by the way, who also joined in the pearl clutching over Schumer's rhetoric. You remember they did this with Nancy Pelosi too, but she said Schumer, what it was, and Paul Ryan came out. Well, we were gonna vote for it till till her speech, and then we just were so hurt that we couldn't do it. You know, so I mean this is the nonsense. It just goes on and on and on. And and you know, Schumer and to me, I think exactly as you do. It reflects the idea that somehow or another, this is about making the Republicans feel shame for what they're doing, making them feel bad about it, somehow convincing them that they're doing the wrong thing. Completely irrelevant to our politics right now. Absolutely 100% irrelevant. And they need to just, you know, they, they need to, well, I say they need, you know, they should, I wish, whatever, that they would dispense with this idea once and for all and recognize that this is hand-to-hand -hand combat at this point and they have to do what they have to do. And, you know, talking about it um, doesn't mean a thing. No, in fact, like I say, I think it actually just projects a tremendous amount of weakness. Uh, I mean, you know, and and I think it, I think it, it, it um, by the time it reaches the ears of the, the people who are ultimately going to vote, um, I mean, aside from like, I think we both agree, it's all meaningless. Uh, everything that, they, like, including the debt ceiling and the back and forth, is all meaningless except for because there's no legislative impact to any of this whatsoever. I mean, I think like, you know, in my most cynical moments, I'm just thinking like there are some people out there who just like you know day traders or uh, big institutional um, you know uh, investors who are like. Yeah, I mean, I'll buy on the uh, dip. Uh, it's like the debt ceiling's not going to happen, but we all know it's going to get raised. Uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll take that 500 point you know bump that came yesterday. I, I mean, it almost feels like it's just sort of it's like a game for that uh, on some level. But in terms of what it's going to mean a year from now, my guess is no one's going to remember this from an electoral standpoint, but it feeds into a theme that Mitch McConnell can push around the Democrats and that Chuck uh, Schumer is, we, we, we're just, we don't have any, we, we have no agency. There's nothing we can do here. And we know they know there's stuff they can do. Joe Biden this week admitted that it's a real possibility for them to get rid of the filibuster to do this. And doesn't that signal to everybody who has been listening to the Democratic establishment, to the leadership, say, we cannot get rid of the filibuster? It is sacrosanct. We, I mean, how is it that they can contemplate doing it for the debt ceiling, but they can't contemplate doing it for somewhere else? Like, I get that it's because certain people don't want the filibuster to go away. But how about we admit that as opposed to this sort of idea of like, it's an institution in the Senate. I mean, and I'm talking about Joe Biden in particular because he's the one who's been saying that kind of rhetoric. Um, it's an institution in the Senate, except for when it's not. Well, that's right. And of course, Joe Biden is the one who would have the most clout in this in this situation if he would just say it and say, yeah, I back getting rid of the fill. It's clear that we can't, you know, that the Republicans are not going to cooperate with anything. We can't even, you know, we can barely keep the government running. They're refusing to, you know, to to help with the debt ceiling. Everything is on the line here. We have to get rid of the filibuster. This is, you know, and and you hear people like Amy Klobuchar saying, "Yes, let's get rid of the filibuster." This isn't a hard lift. Right. If Joe Biden would be a leader on this. I think that and I don't know about Mansion and Cinema. They they are working off of a different set of incentives that are going to have to be dealt with in their own right. But just as a general thing, if the Democratic Party and its leader, who is Joe Biden, were to say outright, 
we want to get rid of the filibuster. We believe this is the only way to help the country, you know, advance or, or grow or, you know, save itself. Um, that's what we're going to do. Now, Manchin came out last night, I think, and said something so fatuous I couldn't believe it. He said, you know, it's, it's the, on- the filibuster is the only thing saving democracy. <laughs> it's like you know you know i want what he's smoking let's just put it that way i mean this is the most ridiculous thing i've ever heard and it is a problem i mean i feel for the democrats you've got these two divas marching around doing their thing it, and it's a very slim margin you know and either of them could decide they're going to switch parties or become independents or do anything i mean it's it's tenuous but they have 48 senators you know this is the big club right this is one of the things that gets me the big Senate club where they all just, it's all about, you know, the, the saucer that cools the tea and all this. And they sit or they go to the cloakroom and they chatter with each other and they're all buddies and everything. You're going to tell me that 48 senators can't lean on mansion and cinema. They have no capability of pushing this to the point where, you know, or finding some way to change the incentives, give mansion and cinema something they want i don't know what they want but maybe there's something they could they would take i don't know but it doesn't seem like they're trying very hard and this is i mean well it's the it'll be the destruction of the biden agenda at the end of the day without a doubt without a doubt they don't pass democratic agenda that's it and and what what i find incredibly frustrating is you're Chuck Schumer. You know for a fact that Joe Manchin has said $1.5 trillion, right? You've been in the Senate with Joe Manchin. Well, I don't know. I guess Joe Manchin's what? He's only on his second term, right? So maybe it's only about 12 years or something. Uh, uh, you've been in the Senate all these years. You're the leader of the, of, of the Senate. Do you think, ah, he doesn't mean it? Or do you think, like, I mean, like what do, like, did, did Chuck Schumer stop to think for a moment? Like maybe what we need to do is start to reorient the talking here. That maybe we need to talk about it like three point five trillion dollars. Maybe we need to start front loading some of these things. Maybe I need to talk to some, you know, maybe I need to talk to Bernie Sanders and say we need to start to try and figure out to front load these things so that we can just uh in a moment look like we're cutting things in half and 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 doing like there doesn't seem to have been there seemed to have been an a a very healthy amount of information that Chuck Schumer had, at least regarding Manchin. Yeah. Maybe maybe he had no clue who Kristen Cinema was, but it was sort of clear when she brought in, you know, Portman and tried to do this bipartisan stuff. It seems like none of them like internalized any of the information that they had. And now we're in this situation here where there just seems to be like uh, like, where are these deadlines coming from? Like, because now it sounds like they're not going to be able to reach October 31st with the reconciliation bill. Like, wh- wh- is anybody... Well, I, are they listening? Because Joe Manchin wants a strategic pause until next year. Is that what we're talking about? I mean, it's all this kabuki until 2022, or in which case it'll be too late. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know. But he's been saying this stuff, and... It seems to me, and you know, this is just from afar, you know, observing it. But it seems to me that they 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 have opted for the first choice that you say, which is, wait, he doesn't really mean it. He's they they're assuming that Mansion is just posturing, and for all I know, that may be true. I don't know, but it's it's clear that so far, whatever posture he's taken has has ruled the day. I mean, his. He, ha- he and Cinema have managed to get us to this point where the reconciliation, which should have passed already. I mean, come on. It's a Democratic, you know, it's 50 votes. <laughs> you know, it's like, in fact, in the reconciliation, you, you can sort of see the hole in, in the filibuster argument in some ways. Because even if we had the filibuster, you'd still have Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Even if we got rid of the filibuster, you'd still have Manchin and Cinema to deal with. So they haven't figured that out. They have not yet figured out what they're doing with that and how they're going to do it. Now, I did have, and there's there's an article by Bob Greenstein for Center for Responsible Budget or whatever, I can't remember. It's in The Hill. And I put it up on my blog this week um, in which he argues that this money, the, the, the numbers that they're talking about are very sort of ephemeral. 
yes. because they don't include certain things. It doesn't, you know, it's sort of a, a gross number and it doesn't reflect the net. And there's a lot of, of stuff that, and, and I had heard this before, there was some talk about this before, about Greenstein had said, look, it's not really 3.5 trillion, but all these these priorities that people have, the child care, the elder care, all this stuff, they're, they're, they're well within bounds of a much lower number to achieve what they want to achieve. In other words, this big number was kind of a weird choice on the Democrats' part to talk about in the first place. But what it did open up was the room to give the two divas, Cinema and Mansion, the ability to say, well, we lowered that number, we did our job, we got her done, and, you know, we, we didn't let those hippies run wild, you know, don't worry, we, we, we're in charge here. And that that was sort of built into this big number that they could bring it down and still preserve their priorities. Now, I had thought that that was seemed very optimistic to me. I was thinking, well, maybe they're clever enough to have done this thing. I'm doubting it now because it's not this is going on so long. They see that they're, it's total chaos. I mean, if it wasn't the case that this was the plan, there doesn't seem to have been any plan to execute that plan. Or right. it's just you, a good idea, you know. But I mean, at this point now, we're we're basically hoping, and just to be clear to people, right? We're talking about three point five trillion dollars over the course of ten years, and presumably. That doesn't mean $350 billion a year, right, for 10 years, because it may take two years to ramp up this program. It may take one year to ramp up this program. You may need to put more money up front if, you know, if you're talking about construction uh, and then operating costs or something like that. I mean, I'm just, you know, broad strokes here. But the bottom line is, is that you could also just say it's a 10-year plan, but we spend all the money in five years and we need more money after that if it's going to continue um and that gets you to 2024 you have the the cost of the bill because you're just funding it for a shorter period of time and you're basically saying to congress like we do with just about everything you're going to have to vote on this or vote against it and, you know, on some level, if the Democrats were smart about this, it seems to me that they would just create a staggering right. um, uh, sunsetting of all of these different um, uh, programs and just say, like, you know, in in the run up to the 2024 election in April, you guys are going to have to vote against extending the tax credit for uh, parents in, um, in, 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 in May, you're going to have to vote against um, the free community college in, in June against paid uh, parental leave. I mean, on and on like this. Um, I mean, hopefully they get there, but it, but it's very hard to look at this leadership now and feel like, they are on top of this right like they they i i it just it's very hard to look at this and just assume and get the sense that the democrats seem to be sort of in charge of it all like why hasn't joe biden been out there talking about what's in this program in the well, bill doing it now he's he was out there yesterday and i think he was out there the day before talking about it but i agree with you that it's been delayed I, I mean i hear democrats like you know there's some really smart ones. you know you hear aoc or katie porter or somebody like that they go on tv and they do they talk about what's in the program they're going you know and and bernie sanders uh, you know he says look what do you want to cut you want to cut medicare benefits you want to cut the community college you know i mean he 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 lays it out there like that what is it that you're against anyway you know i mean he, and he's not afraid to say it and he went after mansion and cinema this week too yeah. you know and i mean he obviously was intensely frustrated uh so which is kind of a clue actually now that i think about it that this was not a planned thing that that, that all of this was just chaos and he, he his he reached sort of the the end of his rope there at least briefly. And he's been very, very good um, in terms of trying to, I mean, come on, this is Bernie Sanders. And he, you know, has been in the past kind of a gadfly in many ways on some of this stuff, you know, sort of being way out there. He has been totally Mr. Responsible in terms of trying to to usher this, this uh, legislation over the line. 
and has been very much the elder statesman doing that. And I think he just kind of, you know, it got frustrated with it this week. And for good reason. It's because that that if if this is the plan, it hasn't materialized. It's as you say, it seems like that may have been a thought, but there's no execution. And in meanwhile, Manchin's running around talking about strategic pauses. Here's cinemas escaping into bathrooms and refusing to talk to anybody. And we're in this stalemate and we still are. So you know, I don't, I, I wish I felt more optimistic. And honestly, I've been a little bit of a Pollyanna up to this point, assuming, thinking it's impossible to believe they won't do it because if they don't, the failure is so extreme, so extreme. that everything is lost. I can't even believe Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema would think that is a good outcome. But I'm beginning to think maybe they do and that others who are quieter in the background are also kind of rooting for this thing to fail. We certainly know there's a handful in the House, um, but you know, we and we're not quite sure of who it is in the Senate that's backing this mansion and cinema play. But I know there are some. So it's hard, I'm really wondering. Yeah, it's hard for me to imagine that 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 Sanders um, uh, attacked cinema and mansion with um, with this intent. But it does also occur to me that if I'm mansion and I'm cinema. And I want to brandish, I mean, this is assuming, right? I mean, because we don't, I mean, you know, Manchin's, I think, incentive structure is fairly straightforward and obvious. Um, he is a corporate crook uh, who also wants to maintain the notion of being, um, you know, uh, independent from his party and not one of these lefties and a guy who will take a, a you know, AR-15 or whatever it is, or a shotgun, and shoot the cap and trade bill. I mean, this is this is the guy who he is. Um, Kristen Cinema is a little bit harder to figure out, of course, Kristen Cinema, because um, she can look at Mark Kelly, who is the other senator from uh, Arizona, a Democrat, doing much better in the polls, doing great in terms of fundraising. Like, no reason why she couldn't have been that guy. Um, in fact, she would have been a better version of uh, mark kelly frankly if she you know if she wanted to but uh, for whatever reason but i guess to the extent that they want to make it clear they are bucking the party to have bernie sanders go out there and and denigrate them or would attack them or whatever it is you know in this era of both like social media and um and hyper polarization People define themselves by their enemies yep. and uh, by their critics. And for Joe Manchin to go out there and go like, I know I've made Bernie Sanders mad. <laughs> I still have respect for him, but I know, I mean, th this is what I imagine he's going to say when he signs off on this bill, if he does. I know Bernie Sanders is not happy. We both, there's a couple of things that we're both unhappy about. He may be a little bit more unhappy than me, but that's okay. And that's what he needs, right? Like Joe Biden, for whatever reason, feels he can't do this. So here's Bernie Sanders uh, filling this role. Um, I don't know if it works on Kristen Cinema. I guess we will see. I mean, but it is just, it's hard to imagine that this was, you know, the plan. We're gonna we're gonna pretend like we're gonna wrap this up by, by early September, and then we'll end up maybe, maybe dragging it through into December. We'll, we'll see. Um, all right, but I wanna, let's, I mean, we're not gonna, resolve this today sadly but the, uh, but the point you did make in terms of like this is it right like this is catastrophic and and the point that um, uh, you, you know you started when you said that um, uh, Manchin had said the only thread we have in America to keep democracy alive and well is the filibuster there was a piece uh, today by um, uh, you know uh, featuring uh, this uh, guy David Shore whose 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 data is like the the hottest new trend in, in democratic but the the, there's some stuff in there that is really distinct from the data, uh, which is pretty straightforward, and we can see it even today. 40 million people more, 40 million more Americans voted for the Democrats who are in the Senate than the Republicans. So right. understand what that means. You're talking about, what is that, 60 to 40 percent? I mean, off the top of my head, maybe more. Uh, of the votes cast for Senate by Americans in this country went for Democrats. Now, granted, that's not the system that we have when it comes to the Senate, but people should understand that dynamic means it is necessarily 
undemocratic. And when you start to impose that dynamic on congressional seats, like we have in many uh, states around the country uh, in this latest uh, redistricting, and we had in 2010, and you see it in like states like Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, Democrats can get 63% of the vote, or excuse me, 53% of the vote, all that are cast for state legislators, and lose... 65 to 35 in their representation. That's a real problem long term, particularly if you are someone who wants health care and um, abortion rights and unemployment and paid uh, family leave and on and on and on and on. College. I mean, this is a real problem because Democrats could very well be a decade or more away from being able to sort of take back any type of levers of government unless they win by, you know, 80 to 20 percent, which is unheard of. I mean, you just need to have that many more Democratic votes because of the nature of the Senate and and, and these redistricting. And so um, this is it. I mean, this could be it for a long time. And you need to use this bill as leverage from a political standpoint too, like force them to end this stuff. Absolutely. I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's so stunning that we, you know, we're sort of only realizing just how undemocratic our fundamental system is. I mean, we're trying to quote, save our democracy and blah, 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 with the Republicans cheating everywhere and doing all this stuff. But really the fundamental structure of it is undemocratic. The Senate is an undemocratic institution. It was designed that way. And it, it works on a certain level if you don't have this kind of partisan polarization that we have. But when you have this, this and it's, you know, it's usually in the past, you could have that, you know, 60, 40 split, but some of the Republicans in conservative states would be, you know, kind of they would be reasonable or you'd have Northeastern Republicans. So there used to be Republicans from California and two presidents came out of Cal Republican presidents came out of California. So, you know, you could have this situation where the states would, you know, you'd have ticket splitting and things like that, but that just isn't happening now. It is a real threat that this is coming down the pike here that we are going to be locked out of majorities for a very long time. And you're absolutely right. What Democrats have to do and what Republicans have done very well. I mean, I would argue that Mitch McConnell's greatest talent is being in the opposition. He's much better at it than he is in the in the majority. He, he's lucky in that the majority of the Republicans really have no agenda anymore other than pulling back regulations, confirming judges and tax cuts. That's all they do. And that's easy enough to do. You can do both those things, by the way, in reconciliation. So, hey, how nice for them. So they can do all that stuff, uh, do anything that they want to do if they're in the majority. But in the minority, Mitch McConnell, that is where he shines. He knows how to thwart the Democrats' agenda. And I would suggest that Democrats need to start thinking about how they can do this, too, how they can use their agenda, the things that people like. If they manage to pass these this big, this big build back better thing, and they do the infrastructure and they do maybe voting rights or some of the other big items on their agenda, then they are forcing the Republicans, if they do win in 2022, God forbid, but it really looks more than possible, um, that they are going to be forcing them to, de to defend taking those things away from the American people. I really think it's the only chance they have. They're going to have to put out, uh, make some big changes and in big reforms and big progress, and then accept the fact that they may have to be in a position of forcing the Republicans to to try and repeal those things. We saw what happened with Obamacare. Yep. Big, you know the John McCain thing. So we know that that's possible to do. Frust you can frustrate Mitch McConnell just like Mitch McConnell can frustrate Chuck Schumer. You just have to play your cards right. Uh, let's just turn to um, the. And then, of course, you know, I, I, I guess lastly, just the, 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 the cinema stuff. I am increasingly of the opinion that um, this is an unabashed good. Uh, you know, like, I, I, I think 
on one hand, you look at how sort of, I don't know, weirdly personal these senators seem to take their jobs, like, like in the sense that there's a disconnect between 10 million people are going to get health insurance, let's say, <clears throat> or I don't like that person. So I'm going to vote a different way. Like, it just seems like there's some type of, and I, and I think, um, I think the more difficult it is for cinema and mansion in their daily lives to, um, to sort of just go about their daily lives without feeling the, the angst that they're creating in the American, you know, in the American public or certainly certain sectors of it. Um, I think it's helpful. I think that just at one point that they, because it may be a situation where they say like, I'm just, whatever, fine, let's just do this. Like this is run out. I mean, because this is, look, this is preening. This, they're not, there's no negotiations that seem to be going on here. It's just complete preening. And it is just about wanting to get a certain amount of attention and uh, brand awareness or whatever it is. And that is, you know, fundamentally a pretty narrow uh, impulse, uh, you know, and it's, it's generated by like sort of like a narrow set of interests. It's this person's feeling like I like to be the center of the attention and I'm going to stay here because if they wanted something, they both could have gotten gotten much of what they wanted by now. I think it's quite evident, right? I mean, if they had come in and said, here's the deal. This is, I want this, this, and this, and I don't want that, that, and that. We'd be darn close to wrapping this thing up, and it doesn't appear that they've done any of that, particularly match, I mean, uh, cinema. And so if it really is just about, like, I like to be in the limelight, and I'm like, I want to be the it person for the day, make them understand there's a cost associated with that. That means that, like, can't go out and, uh, you know, eat at your favorite restaurant without, like, it being, you know, I, am I going to have uh, some uh, immigrant who's, whose grandmother died and they couldn't visit her? Am I going to have to hear that story at dinner? You know, like, uh, yeah, I think maybe you do need to hear that story. Um, or, uh, you know, someone whose uh, prescription drugs are too expensive, they can't take it. Maybe you do need to hear that story at dinner. Um, or in the movie theater or on your airplane or wherever it is. I mean, I think that, um, you know, that's my feeling with that. And so we'll see about Kristen Cinema. But boy, the right was really, um, they really came in, swooped in, really, really concerned about about her not hearing a speech from an immigrant in, an, in, a, in, a, in a bathroom. That, that's, that's, uh, that's tough. And the press uh, did too. The press, the press was very upset about it as well. <clears throat> it was really a terrible, terrible thing. Of course, these are the same people you know, they chased Mitt Romney through the airport, called him a traitor on the airplane. They chased Lindsey Graham through the airport, had to get security. They chased Anthony Gonzalez out of the party and out of politics by making his family and him feel so insecure that they had to have police escorts going through airports. So, uh, you know, I'm not really, really feeling the, uh, you know, the concern uh, on the part of these Republicans and the press over that. I mean, it oh, seems, like, I mean, you know, they're going after school board members. I mean, they're exactly. threatening healthcare workers. They're threatening teachers and, and, you know, I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, he election workers, think about those poor people. I mean, they're getting harassed at their homes. Let's just, let's, this is ridiculous. I mean, it, these, these, these nice little, you know, young people who were just sitting there saying, looking at their phone again, we helped you get elected and we really wanted you to do something like this. Yeah, that's very threatening. Poor Kirsten. Poor, poor Kirsten. Um, let's talk about this Senate report. It didn't get a lot of attention, but there was a pretty blockbuster, it seems to me, a report that there was a guy in the, de the Department of Justice who had been, who had basically gone around his superiors, connected with Donald Trump, was promised by Donald Trump to be the acting attorney general of the United States, the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, if he plays up the idea that Georgia was stolen. And 
you know, I guess some people uh, tell us the details of this, but I guess some people could say like, well, the system worked, but you know, I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, it, that sort of feels like, well, you know, you're pretty close. Like, I, I don't think I would be, you know. Well, you could finish the uh, sentence. The system worked in an attempted coup. Yes. I mean, if I drive off a cliff and, uh, you know, in my car and I just happen to be OK, like I walk away from that accident, I don't walk away going like, eh, I don't, have to, I don't have to worry in the future. I can do that again because it worked. The system worked. <laughs> I didn't die. The system worked. Um, what, walk us through this because it's pretty. I, I think this is a bigger deal than it than the attention it's getting. I do too. I, I mean, I'm actually shocked. I wrote about it for Salon this morning. This, I mean, the what basically happened was this. I mean, first of all, Trump was running several coup plots at the same time, right? He had Giuliani and Sidney Powell out in the states running, doing lawsuits that they were hoping to get the Supreme Court to overturn the election. They had, you know, he had. Uh, uh, this guy Eastman, John Eastman, drawing up plans for Mike Pence to to you know not count electoral votes and then throw it into the House so that they could you know so that Donald Trump could win. Now this one, some of it's been reported in the past. We knew that Rosen, who was the acting Attorney General after Bill Barr left, and there's a story in that too because you know it was kind of weird that Bill Barr just sort of said, "Hey, I'm out of here." Abruptly, he was the top toady. For, for Trump and actually did help Trump by saying the, that the Department of Justice could investigate voter fraud as the votes were still being counted, which was unprecedented and went outside of normal Department of Justice protocol. But he ended up kind of running out, you know, de deserting the sinking ship at the end of December of 2020, abruptly and kind of weirdly just kind of left. And so he was replaced by his assistant at the time, the deputy attorney general, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, became the acting attorney general. In any case, we knew that there had been this weird thing that happened with this guy named Jeffrey Clark, who had worked in the civil division. He wasn't involved in, he wasn't in the top echelon of the Department of Justice, but somehow or another, he connected with Trump, we now know, through a Pennsylvania congressman who had, had told Trump you know, I've got this guy in the Department of Justice, apparently, and he's on, he's with you. You need to talk to him. Clark came and started working with Trump on, on a, a coup plot that had to do with the Department of Justice, which is, as you say, suggesting that they send a letter to the Georgia um, legislature saying that they had evidence of voter irregularity in the election and that they should call a special session and do what they will with the electoral votes. In other words, to you know overturn the election in Georgia. And it was planned, he wrote a draft letter um, stating all this, and it was also planned that it would go to a bunch of other states, the other states where it was closed and that they were, they were contesting the election. So through this period, after Rosen came in, Trump was on the horn with him almost daily, sometimes several times daily, trying to convince him and this was all documented by his by his deputy uh, Donahue, who was taking notes through the whole thing, and that he was pressuring him constantly to to work with Clark to do this thing. And they finally reached a point where Clark called up Rosen and said, "Hey, look, you know Trump's going to replace you with me if you don't do what he says." And there were threats coming from other people, too. Apparently, there was some guy who was involved in that weird Texas lawsuit that they sent to the Supreme Court, you know, that all the attorneys general signed on to. He calls up and said, hey, if he calls up Rosen, the attorney general, just some lawyer. I guess Trump gave him his number, calls him up and says, you know, if you don't work with us on this, I'm going to have to tell the president that you're being recalcitrant. You know, some kind of threat. I mean, actually, you said that. I'm going to have to tell the president that you're being recalcitrant. So in any case, and all this is documented. This is coming from testimony from the people who were involved. And Rosen, you know, and Donahue, they're saying, well, we're not going to do that. And if if Trump replaced, you know, we're out. We're All of us are out. So they have this big meeting on January 3rd in the White House. And it's with Rosen, Donahue, Clark was there, and the White House counsel, uh, Pat Cipollone, and his deputy, and Trump. And they talk for hours about this thing. And when, when at the beginning of the meeting, when Rosen walks in, uh, Trump says to him, well, we know that you, Rosen, you're not going to overturn the election. It's like, 
Wow, talk about saying the quiet part out loud there, Trump. Right. But, you know, in any case, they, they had this long discussion in which it was brought up that, you know, if Clark replaces Rosen, that everybody, uh, the entire top level of the Department of Justice will, will quit. And Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, said he'd quit too. He called, he and his people were going to quit. And, you know, remember at this point, there was all kinds of churning. There were people kind of getting ready to leave and all this. And so Cipollone says that and he called it a murder-suicide pact, right? That if you do this, the whole thing's going to explode. You're going to be He's saying this to, to Trump. I mean, to he's Trump. saying yeah. Trump that this is, this is a no-way win. This is a no-win situation for you. Right. You're, you're, you, you, will, you will lose. This will be done. You, you, you absolutely do not want to do this. So Trump was apparent at that point. He backed off. It took hours, apparently, to get him to that point, to talk him off this ledge. These people were just sitting there telling him, look, it can't be done. So Trump finally agrees. And he says, OK, we won't do this. Now, remember, he had other coup plots in his back pocket. He was juggling other things. He still had Giuliani out there. He had Eastman getting, you know, prepping Mike Pence to, to overturn the election. And of course, he had January 6th coming up, which he had signaled to all his people, come to D.C., it will be wild. So, that you know, the fact that he set aside this Department of Justice plot at the last minute, which he, by the way, had been working on for weeks and pushing, pushing, pushing. Well, this is the part that gets me. <laughs> so they come out with this report, right? This is and it's shocking and stunning. This is a president who was plotting a coup. There's no doubt about it. It is there in black and white. And he was trying, pressuring top levels of the Justice Department to go along with it. And remember, he had had some success pressuring top, you know, he had replaced his Department of National, um, National Intelligence uh, with a toady, John Ratcliffe. He had implanted a bunch of people in the Pentagon, more of his, his henchmen over there. So, you know, he thought he could do this. He thought he could replace Rosen with Clark. And it was only his own person, I think Pat Cipollone, his White House counsel, who was a very loyal Trumper, who yep. convinced him that this was not going to work for him. So what happens then? They put out the report yesterday, and out come the Republicans with a report saying, well, we don't understand what the problem is. The president merely asked for advice from his senior advisors, and then he followed it. That is what they said. It is shocking. So apparently it's perfectly normal for presidents to plot coups, but, but if the advisors advise against it and he follows the advice, it's all good. So no, nothing to see here. And and here's the thing, is that all this stuff, whether it was the Eastman memo or um, all these machinations from, you know, number three at the, the DOJ or four or whatever uh, uh, Clark was. I was way down that list. Right, well, way way down the list. I mean, the point is, Dick Cheney came up with the unitary uh, executive theory about... 30 years before he was able to implement it. Yeah. These ideas don't just go and get yeah, shelved, yeah. particularly when they get this close. These are all, in some ways, we don't know that until in retrospect, dry runs. And uh, so, I mean, this is, you know, again, this is one of those situations where the people need to be held to account. It's going to be interesting to see if they do anything with the uh, subpoenas. But uh, we are out of uh, time. We'll, we'll have a better sense, I think, uh, by midweek next week, if they're going to do anything to to hold those subpoenas as uh, as 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 being worth. Well, the paper. remember, they put Susan McDougal, they put her on a perp walk, put her in in handcuffs and jailed her for 18 months for refusing to testify. That's a good point. That's over uh, Whitewater. Yeah. Uh, Heather Parton, Digby, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Sam. Have a great weekend. All right. Quick break. We'll be right back after this.
All right. Well, if you're watching us on Peacock, that is all our time today. I just wanted to say uh, McDougal, Susan McDougal did go to prison for at least 18 months. I think it was closer, maybe even to 22 months, but uh, total time. It was because she refused to answer questions of a grand jury um, about Bill Clinton and um, uh, apparently some questions about sexual stuff. Um, so it wasn't necessarily uh, avoiding a subpoena from Congress. Nevertheless, um, you're supposed to actually, you, you want a Congress that's able to subpoena people, I think, uh, to talk. You know, people want to go there, plead the fifth, you plead the fifth. Or you just say goodbye, as I will say to those of us, uh, those of you who are watching us on Peacock. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday. For those of you who are sticking around, ooh, do we have a surprise for you? Well, it's not really a surprise. Um, but before we do, we need to play some music. Why don't we uh, play the music and then let her in as the music plays? Ladies and gentlemen, it has been far too long to welcome our next guest. I give you, ladies and gentlemen, Judy Gold. Level headed. Fuck you! Calm, cool, and collected. I have a bigger penis than him. Judy Gold is on the line to keep us all connected. What the fuck is the matter with him? A steady hand to guide us. She'll keep us calm and carry on. No fucking way! <laughs> Too bad Jimmy Reefer Cuck didn't find her worthy of a song. Well, Judy Gold. And he's, a, he's such a fucking penis head liar. That I'm not kidding. Kind that's our, the president of the United States. That's the president. What the fuck? Like, this guy, he's, I, oh, I fucking, how did this happen? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Judy Gold. Hello, Judy. Hello, I'm trying to get on my stupid fucking headset, but it's not working. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it all seems to be. But you don't need it, right? Because it's I me. Mean, yeah, it's you. I mean, we. I. I hear you. It's all. Uh, you sound good. Uh, I don't look know. Look how you... handsome you look. Well, thank you. You look great yourself. Oh, it, please, sort of I just an got odd... off the Peloton. I just got... got off the Peloton. I, oh, you. You got a Peloton. I did. Yeah, I caved. You caved yeah. the Peloton. And um, all right. Well, that's exciting. What do you do? No, it's on... not. I'm so fucking fat. I'm sick of it. Wait, wait. So, what do you do on the Peloton? Like, I don't. Like, I'm not clear. It's the Peloton. Okay. Peloton. So the Peloton, wait, I'm moving my, well, it's fine. The Peloton um, has, you know, you can spin, which is a lot of spinning and it's a lot of, oh, you can be whoever you are. You can be who you want to be. Who do you want to be today? And everyone's like perfect looking and it's really, and I wait, fucking hate that. Everybody's perfect looking. So there's, there's a video, there's video. Oh yeah, it's a whole big screen okay. and they're all telling you to you gotta walk climb 400,000 hills, you know. Who and are these people? Is it live? Are they, are they in a, like a, a room? There school? are, Samuel, there are some live classes and then they're all recorded. So you can pick, you know, people have their favorite um, instructors and then I need an instructor who's going to be like, you know, wow, you decided to get on the bike today, great. How much weight did you gain? You're gonna move your leg, like someone like that who's gonna. But it's it's a lot of. Okay, we're gonna go higher. Are they all up. British? Yeah. Now wait a second. Now wait a second. So, can they see you if you're doing a live instructor? No. Can they? They can't see. Well, you. they can see your name, and they're always like, "Oh, congratulations, Sam Cedar, seven thousand rides. Congratulations!" You know. Yeah. And happy birthday! Happy birthday, Matt! Happy birthdays! Ten million rides, Bradley! Here you are, your fourth, your first ride. That's great. You know, it's like it's so fucking annoying. And then they have meditation. Then you can get it on your phone too. So you like when you're walking in the woods, they can be like, okay, go ahead. It's like a whole. But I had to get it because I used to go to the gym all the time. And then I don't know if you heard about the pandemic. So I I've heard to... about the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I got to say, this Peloton thing seems to really agree with you. I feel like you're calmer. I feel like <laughs> you are more centered and more balanced. 
Um, and I feel like this energy that you're getting out with the Peloton, I feel like it's really, really, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a wow new, new Judy gold in a way. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Okay. No, I really am picking up on this. It's, it's really made you like even keeled. Yeah. That's, that's the, yeah, that would be the term to describe me even keeled. So. Have you been recognized by an instructor on there? Did they go like, oh my God, Judy, go no, well, oh, favorite. No, I feel like people like, cause you can high five people like during the class, you can. How you do you can, high five somebody like, like it, it shows up on your screen. It's like, like high an emoji. Five. Like an emoji. Right. Now, yeah, can you look at the left name. and right and see these people or you can't see them? No, you can't see anyone. It's just your name. And then you have hashtags. So since my name is Judy Gold, J-E-W-D-Y, I feel like they avoid me. I see. I you see. know, because they're never going to be like, oh, Judy Gold, Jew. Oh. <laughs> you know, they're right, never going right. to do that. So, they're going to pretend like they're not picking up on that. It also tell it says like male in their 40s. You know, it'll be, you know, that they have that information. And so... And then it had you can you can start a class with a bunch of people to be like, oh, I go by the music. So you'll be like, oh, I want a 70s disco class. And then they'll say you can take a class with 20 other people in five minutes. And they're gonna, these are people who are gonna take the same class as you. And then you can be competitive with them and they're all like ahead of you, and you're the last one. You feel like a fat fucking piece of shit who can't breathe. It's fun. Well, it sounds like it sounds a, yeah. lot, a lot of fun. Sounds like you're having a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Um, in shape, baby. Uh, well, I mean, and so now, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Speaking of um, uh, keeping you in shape, have you started to go out and do comedy yes. shows live? Yes, I have, Samuel. I um, Inside. Inside. They have to be vaxxed. masked. Oh, they have to be masked. And uh, no, I mean, they have vaxxed. to be vaxxed. They vaxxed. have to be vaxxed. Okay. And then um, it was masked. Now they've just done vaxxed. It went from like 25% of the people, you know, capacity, masked and vaxxed. Then it went to 50% masked and, va and, and everyone gets their own microphone. So there's like a bucket with used microphones and new microphones. Oh, that's hilarious. So, you, so you'd have to walk on stage and switch the mic out. And every time I would just walk on stage and forget, you know, cause I'm doing this so long. I don't fucking right. bring you never, mic. Yeah. So I'd be like, oh fuck, can someone bring me a mic? And then now it's just, you have to be vaxxed and audience yeah. has to be vaxxed and too, right? Everybody, everybody in the place. Everybody has to be vaxxed. Uh, Coleman actually brought his own. I used to bring my own mic, and then I, I didn't know they were not doing the you know clean mic bucket and dirty mic bucket. So I might start bringing my own mic again. Or, they or, smell anyway. Don't, don't Yeah, no, uh, I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Ones are they, they? They should be all personalized. It seems to me. Right. Um. Did you catch Jim Brewer's? Uh, he's not. He's only doing unvaxed stuff. Good. Have fun. <laughs> what is? I, I just don't. This is the fight. This is the no, hill they're going to die on. Isn't that marketing? Uh, isn't that just marketing? Isn't Brewer just sitting there going like, "Oh, wait a second. I don't really care about this one way or another." But uh, but right. I'm gonna make. Okay. I'm gonna get every single comedy person who doesn't want to get vaccinated or is pissed at vaccination. They're all just going to come and see me. It's going to be like a, it's not even going to be like, a, these aren't going to be fans. These are going to be activists. Right. And if that's who you want in your audience, great. Have fun with that. Well, I think uh, Jib does, frankly. Um, now, let me ask you, this. <laughs> um, what, uh, so how has it been? Like, how was it? Like, is like, are the audiences just sort of like, ecstatic well, that they're there yes, yes. i'm gonna say like when i go out i the closest i've been into a closed environment has been like in a bar with like all the doors open in the open. front yeah 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 Almost like a garage and i'm in there and 20 percent of me is you know just a ball of anxiety and then the other right. percent is you know i don't know I'm, I'm i'm trying to watch a game or something like that 
Okay, but isn't that normal without a pandemic? I, 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 there's 25% to 35% of me that's anxious. But right. then you get the extra 20%. So it's really Okay, so you're 40, 45, yeah, okay. 55% um, anxiety. Uh, but I get an extra 20% of anxiety, 25% yeah. anxiety. Um, I, I definitely feel it. I mean, the seller is, the ones in New York are very strict. Um, but I do feel it like, you know how you used to, like selling merch or something like that. That I can't deal with. That's what yeah, hang around. freaks me yeah, the I fuck out. Yeah. yeah. And like do, shaking my hand and can I have a hug and can I take a selfie? You know, it's fine. And then you take a selfie with someone and they're, and they're like, can you take your mask off? And then if you do that, then everyone on the internet's like, oh, I thought you were a vaxxer and you're taking your mask off. It's like, shut the fuck up. But um, they're pretty strict. They're pretty strict. But I have to go to Florida in November. I'm really worried about that. Uh, well, I mean, the upside is that everything seems to be going down right now. Um, there is some notion that people have had that there's tends to be like two month cycles for a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know. We don't know yet. We did. But just, you know what? What I do know that it what? could have been over if these fucking assholes would have worn their fucking masks and gotten vaxxed. But no. We have to have a bunch of dumb fucking idiots. And then I have to read articles, you know, how to talk to an anti-vaxxer, how to talk to me, how do you say what to say? Here's what you say to an anti-vaxxer. Fuck you, you selfish piece of shit. I hope you get COVID. Bye now, fucking asshole. That's what you're supposed to say. Are you sure that's exposure? Yes, that's I read all the articles. Go fuck yourself. I hope you get COVID and D D I E. Okay. Cause you're an asshole. You know, it's like not about them. It's about other people. I, I mean, yes, I, I would agree. And I, I mean, I don't know for me, I, my anger is really geared towards people who are, who are espousing the anti-vax stuff. I mean, right. I think there's a lot of people out there. Uh, there's a decent amount of people out there who I think are just don't understand how important it is, and and it might be too difficult for them to do it. I mean, certainly the 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 vaccine mandates helped because it forced the companies to give people time off at least. Right. I mean, I get the autoimmune people. Yes, I totally understand that. But you know what? You're already vaxxed, asshole, and your dog is vaxxed. So what the fuck is wrong with you? There is a, um, uh, well, I think part of it is you got people out there who are just like, who are, who are promoting it, who are, you know, right. in where people trust them and they're promoting it. And um, it is, uh, it seems pretty messed up. And then there's other people who just sort of feel like the real story here is how we're suppressing the truth about um, some drug, name it, that might mitigate the impact of COVID. That's the real story. That's not actually the real story. Right. The story is people are telling other people not to get vaccinated. Right. So what is, um, all right, but-, but be, And yeah. harassing people and harassing, you know, parents bringing their kids to school. It's like, yep. if you don't want to get vaccinated and you want to die from COVID, be my guest, have fun, enjoy, go fuck yourself. But leave people alone, leave people alone. There is, it is sort of stunning when you think about how much more harassment we've seen right. from people who don't want other people to wear masks. Right. From people who are telling other people to wear masks. Now, I get it. Maybe you're walking down the street and somebody gives you a look at one point during this, like, hmm. But that's, you know, uh, I think we're adults here. We can all handle it. Okay, here's the worst part. Look at somebody. The worst part, see, I, the, place I'm the most fearful is in airports, not on the plane, but in the airports. And I am going to get killed because first of all, the ones who wear the chin diaper and don't cover their nose, the passive aggressive fucks, those are the worst. So I now have resorted to anytime I walk past someone, I'm like, nose! If they're not wearing a mask, I'm like, mask! And I'm, I think I'm gonna get killed, but I don't care. I mean, I do care. I don't really want to get killed, but you know what I mean? It's just, what? you know, it's supposed to be over your nose. And I was on a flight where they had to escort a family off. Really? 
Yep. The parents wouldn't wear it and they wouldn't make the kids wear it. Well, what do they think? They go on the plane and they think like, well, they'll right. let be the ones who aren't, uh, you know, it's much harder for the four of us, coincidentally, than everybody else on the plane. Right, right. Judy. Yes. Um, what would it take? Yes. For you to get someone to walk behind you in an airport, videotaping you yelling at people, nose, mask. I do it all. anytime. But I need somebody to videotape you doing it. I, I, I don't want it. Okay. Well, not I, you know, you... I'm a comedian. I don't travel with anyone. Well, I mean, you... I'll try. I'll tr I mean, I'm going to my niece's wedding. I could maybe get, you know, someone to Where is that? Is that going to be outdoor? What's it, well, I mean, uh, what's the yes, deal? Arizona. All right. There you go. I, mm -hmm. What else What else is new? Like, uh, so uh, as your, it feels like your life has sort of changed pretty significantly from, I mean, I don't think, you know, people understood, like people in bands and uh, comedians, yeah. they're, they're, they were completely shut down. A uh, small subset of people, uh, everybody else is shut down, but they're, you, you've been doing stand up like X number of nights a week for 30, 40 years. Right. It's awful. But I did do a lot of outdoor and Zoom, but yeah, it's like your life completely stops. But I did learn I don't need to go out every single night and do sets. Um, but I did have my book come out in the middle of the pandemic. So that was all virtual. So that sucked. Yep. Um, but I was busy. I kept myself busy, but I've always done that. But yeah, hearing that audience live the, for the first time in May. Oh, my God. It was unbelievable. And by the way, Samuel, a lot of people are like, why haven't you been on the majority report? And I'm like, ask Sam because I don't know. Apparently, you know, because I, you are one of the two shows where people stop me and are like, I heard they actually come to my shows because of this show. What is the other show? Uh, Sandra Bernhardt on Sirius XM. Oh, all right. Fair yeah, enough. those are the two people, two I shows where I'm like, I listen to you or when are you going to be on and blah, 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 blah. I didn't realize uh, she yes. had a show on there. I did. I did one of her like talk shows way, way back in the day. Right. She had one of those type of things. Yeah. She was still. Um, well, I'm glad. I, you know, well, part of the reason why you do that is to like you sending a message. You know, like uh, that's what you do. You hold back. You little. have turned into such a Jew. You know, you send a message. Of, uh, what is going on with you? Your hair well, looks fucking amazing. Well, thank you. The hair's grown long. Yeah. That's me a lot of confidence to get a little more Jewy. Right. Yeah, you're definitely Jewing it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally Jewing it up. Yeah. So, but, but is it so? Is it going to be the same? Like when you go into these rooms now, is it the same? You know what? Here, it, here's the difference, Sam. I have now realized that. Uh, you know, my act is pretty much dedicated to telling people to stop fucking taking themselves so seriously. And it's okay to laugh. And, you know, everything is not about you. No comic was thinking about your childhood trauma when they wrote this bit, okay? It's not about you. And the thing I've noticed, they are ready to laugh. They really want to laugh because they felt like, you know, that they were without laughter for so long. Oh, shut up, phone. Shut the fuck up. It's my Mary Tyler Moore theme, phone. Okay. And I noticed that you'll say a joke, you'll do a joke that could be deemed controversial, and they will laugh and then catch themselves. Like, <laughs> oh, boy, they're not supposed to laugh at that. And that is the saddest part of going back to the clubs. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, are we going to really do this satire, um, humor? I don't want to live in a world without laughter because you're triggered by a word, okay? Listen to the fucking thought. T listen to the intent of the comic. You know, it's just, that's the part, that's what I've... And there's also been a split in the comedy community, which there never was, with this vax and you know it's true with the mask and vax and orange fuck face interesting that is interesting you remember when it was all we were all like always had each other's backs 
I mean, I, you know, was never deep in the right. uh, the stand-up world. And I will say that, like, in Boston, we would we would work, like, you know, I worked primarily, like, a Catch, a Rising Star, and then I would do some right. outside rooms, but not that much. And uh, there was, like, a little bit of a cleave that I think is similar to the one that exists now, where it's just, like, there was um, the, you know... I think I think we would have been called, you know, like our crew, like you know, Cross and, uh, yeah. and the people coming out of like uh, Catch to some extent, and there was like other, uh, you know, sort of more, I don't know, um, people maybe who were, well, I don't know if they were necessarily more local Boston, but they were just, um, I just sort of feel like the way I would express it is that they would call i i got the feeling they would call us fags because we would talk right, about right 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 uh, but you know boston was ruled by like lenny clark you know yes and that that but was I, the brand of comedy and then there was there were you guys and paula poundstone and all these people who were like really a different genre yeah um, but i mean but but i think but isn't that very similar to the line now I mean, isn't that like when we talk about that, that cleave, I mean, isn't there a lot of that? Like, right. Like, um, there was respect. There was, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I did go to Boston a lot to perform because it was a great place to, you know, yes. Deal with shit audiences who were like, not gonna, you know, it was hard. It was yes. harder. Um, it was rowdier. It was, it, it, it you lo definitely learned something from Boston audiences, but I don't know. I always felt like there was some sort of respect, but may I don't know because I don't. I wasn't in your little. I mean, I, I just I, I I just you know sensed that like if I went to Nick's comedy stop, uh, yeah. there was a little bit of hostility. And, right. was, and there was, I, but that I went there on purpose to, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you wanted to get shot. people's face, yeah. and you wanted to also like you know that that I think hone my craft. Yeah. F you know, f feeds you, it feels like a little right. bit. But it is interesting that there's this split in the comedy world, both in terms of like that vax and stuff. And I think the, the, the you know, the language stuff, like, I mean, broadly speaking, I, I tend to believe that intent is hugely important. Right. I also, you know, I never found comedy so sacrosanct that I, that I cared that much about it. I do remember right. when I said that uh, as a kid, we had a, a Hebrew school confirmation class uh, talent show, and uh, I must have been probably like 13 or 14. I had seen Rodney Dangerfield at the Chateau de Ville in, uh, in Newton. My, my buddy, Charlie's uh, brother, uh, took us there. And so I had memorized all these uh, Rodney Dangerfield things, and I'm out there, and it's just like the parents and the rabbis. And I say, I send my kid to college, He's majoring in fucking off. And I hear, <laughs> I hear that same thing. <laughs> and everybody just sucks in as they realize like the rabbis are there. Right. And he just said, fuck off in the, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. And the rabbi and I never got, never, never got past that. Oh, cause the rabbi never says fuck off either. You know, we actually got into a big fight when well, I think we, there was like a confirmation trip to Israel and I, I didn't, we, 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 it had to do with Lebanon. It ended up getting, I got very estranged from that rabbi. All right. Where is he now? I think he was hugely successful after that. No way. Yes. He went on to probably get to a much bigger congregation. All right then. Yep. And look at you. You're on the television yep. and the radio. Right. Right. Where is he now? Where well, the, what the hell is he doing? Fasting? He's probably, Is he fasting? Probably very. He hasn't, old. He's never had a lobster roll. No, that's probably also true. He's or missing. A cheeseburger. Oh, so what else is happening? So so you, you must be like okay. energized so, by the comedy, and then and then what? Is that it? So I wrote. I got a writing job. I wrote on uh, season five, which is unfortunately the final season of Better Things, which is on FX, which is stars Pamela Adlon. Ah. And I play a character. I played a character last season. I played the same character this season. And I also was in the writer's room. So that was great. That was like a gift from God. Um, and so I don't know what- you were out in LA or are you just in the writer's no, room? No, no, it was Zoom. I, I was just in LA, but yeah, it was Zoom. And um, 
which is interesting because I still haven't met the writers in person. And I really, I've tried to explain to them how gigantic I am. And I don't think that they realize that I'm gigantic because we really just saw each other's head. But um, it was, it was great. That was great. I just, and I don't know what's going on, but I am getting cast in all these dramatic roles lately. Like what? And I've been, like I've been, well, I'm not allowed to talk about one that I'm doing, but there's one I did, I got cast in um, The First Lady on Showtime. Whoa. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, there, I'm in the Eleanor Roosevelt block. Eleanor Roosevelt is played by Jillian Anderson. I've heard of her. She's, uh, yes. she's out there, right? Yeah. Lovely person. Um, and then I just did Better Things. I just shot Better Things. And then I'm doing something else. Now I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I mean, I'm not, I'm not complaining, even though I could. But yeah. Why would you complain? No, I'm just saying, because that's all I fucking do, Sam. Uh, do you find being in a writer's room via Zoom better than being in a writer's room not via zoom like like no. is i mean the only the zoom versus lot like you can't read you can't read other people's like like right body language language but, but i could send messages to one writer about another writer so okay. i was always like you can you can believe that person you yeah careful um, can you believe what the fuck? And, and so um, in the room, the way that that happens is you just go in like a quick, a quick glance. Like when, right. like, like if Matt's over there and he's reading his storyline, you're just looking over like more of this shit and, um, right. you can't say it, but now you can actually like articulate the whole thing. Well, now you can, you know, we were talking all over each other, like the view. So then Pamela sent us all uh flags so then we had to raise a flag that didn't work um <laughs> um like a real flag uh but i mean we figured it out but the the good thing about zoom room was that it'd be like all right you guys ready for lunch and then you know come back in 45 minutes and i go i go ride the peloton you know like i wouldn't do that if i was right you know so i did you could get shit done because you weren't traveling anywhere, but it was also LA time. So I, I worked late and I'm also sitting in a fucking chair um, all day. I wish I could. Staring uh, at people. I wish I could understand what that meant, what that was about. <laughs> God, you're funny. God, I, you have not lost it, Sam. Yep, uh, to the extent that I ever had it, yeah. I still yeah. have it intact. That's yes, why you, you really it. do. You never want it too, too much. Right, right. You have more to lose. Right. When is all right? And I, I just want to ask. Yeah. I know that you haven't asked me about this. When the fuck is that asshole going to be arrested? When the fuck? Okay, sorry. I don't know that he's gonna. I think that I would put. Um, Probably a better chance of being president in 2024 than getting arrested. I got to move. Where would you go? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Nova Scotia? I can't go to Germany because I'm not, you know, a lot of people are getting their German passports because they're what? great. They're great. Yeah, because their grandparents died in the Holocaust. They're giving out, you know. Oh. I mean, I, I always wanted to go to Berlin, but no, that's, I don't know. I'm not Irish. You're not Irish? No, I'm not. I just, I like, it's just really upsetting, Sam. I, I, I understand. Are you following politics as much or no? Do you find I'm that trying not to, but then I, you know, I do get the paper. Here's the paper. Um, in general, are following politics less or more? Less. Yeah. Much less, because right? Because... Yeah, but I still want to know what's going on. And I, you know, and I have realized he did monopolize so much of my fucking brain. Um, but I just, it's like, I, I do, I've always believed that people in karma, I have believed in karma. And now I don't believe, like, I just can't believe this shit. That he's getting away with it. 
Right. And that fu- those fuckers aren't showing up for their subpoenas. Their subpoenas is. I hate them. I just, they're disgusting. Is there any and way that to, insurrection that that with, the, with the, the Peloton? Like you can maybe like, uh, I sort of feel like if you had the ability to, you know, ride your bike and, and run over some of these people, you might. Oh my uh, God. Wouldn't that be great? Or if they had a, a boxing class and it was that those fucking assholes. Oh my God. I would love that. You can do boxing on your Peloton. No, I'm just saying if they did. All right. I'm sure they have a boxing class. They have so many classes, Sam. But how do you box on your bicycle? You no, they have classes off the bicycle. They have like floor shit. You get it, it you put it on your, you know, computer or your iPad or something. Yeah. Or the new one has a has a uh movable screen. All right. Mm-hmm. I will think about it. Probably not. Okay. Uh, well, you look Julie, great. Well, you look great too. It has been great catching up with you. I'm so glad all these things. I can't wait to to see you on some show. I know. I can't believe it. I'm gonna be. You're, you'll be like, wow, she really can act. I don't have. I I, I knew this. I've known this for for twenty years ago. Twenty two years ago, I cast you. Your acting you. was that's ex- right. Exquisite in that. Do you think it was more than twenty years ago? Because I don't think I had a child then. It was it was more than 20 years ago. Oh my god, we're so fucking old. I know it. Do you wake up sometimes and you're like, "Oh my god, I have maybe maybe 30 good years left." Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um <laughs> I wouldn't say that I wake up sometimes. I would say <laughs> twice a night. Twice a night. Um and I'm pushing it with 30. I'm pushing it with 30. Two and 4 a.m. And then the other is whenever yeah. I get up, which is, you know, three hours later. Right. So. And then what I do is I go, okay, in I maybe I have 25 good years. And then I go back 25 and I remember everything because it wasn't that fucking long ago. And then you're like, oh my God, I'm dead. I'm de- almost dead. 30, yeah. I mean, 30 is just not, I mean, 30. 30 really solid good years. I mean, I'm looking for another 50 that wow. last. I've made some commitments, uh, oh, but I good. imagine really 30. But, you know, I, I know people who, who they're in their early 90s and you'd think they were 70. I know, but they're not, still I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to. Right. I mean, there's good. They're still, even though they're, they seem like there's, there's still leakage and shit going on that I don't want to deal with. Oh yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Judy, we will update this as we get closer and closer to the end of that. Yes. Episode. Now listen, Sam, I got to plug a, a date because uh, I'm going to be in Scarsdale where there's a lot of Jews. Right. October they- 23rd at some new club called Jackie B's and I want to plug that date. Jackie B's. And, and Jackie are you B's. still doing the podcast or no? Yes. I'm... That's nice. That's nice. I don't that know. Is so I nice. have, That's so nice. You still doing that radio thing you do with the, the reporting? People ask me that while I'm interviewing them. <laughs> Wait, I'm looking at my other dates. I've had I'm people gonna... ask me if I'm still doing the majority report as I'm interviewing them, like literally. All right, who asked you that? Who asked you that? Steve McKenzie. Oh, he's a fucking asshole. He's um, quite an I'm going to be in, where am I going to be? Um, and I'm going to be in Florida at the Misner Park Cultural Center, November 6th. People can go to judygold.com. Yes, they can. Or, link. you know, Florida. My, well, uh, I can't believe, can you believe that fucking DeSanta? I fucking... Whatever. Um, yeah, so that's it. I'm going to be traveling and uh, showing up on your television set. <laughs> Folks, go out and see Judy. Uh, Sam, I miss you. Can we not? Can I not? Yeah. I need you not to wait as this long I know. Anymore. I don't know what happened, I to be honest with you. I really don't. I just, I, I, I lose track of time. Right. Well, just remember, 30. Judy, I love you. Thank you so much. I love you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that 
concludes the free portion of our program today. Hate to be abrupt, but just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. If you want to help this show survive and thrive, become a member today. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only support the free show, you get the fun half, which we do almost every single day of the year. That is a um, weekday, almost. So there you go. Uh, join the majority report.com. Also, majority discord. Come on, the discord. We got 4,000 people there. Check out the AM quickie. Go to majority.fm, scroll down, sign up. You get the AM quickie every morning in your email inbox. And uh, also, justcoffee.co up, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, on Sunday, David Griscom and I will be recording the October Think Tank for Left Reckoning, patreon.com slash left reckoning. I'm going to be talking, to, uh, there's a question, I think, asking me about how I read books. So I'm going to be giving a little bit of a tutorial on that, um, how to say... <gasps> Uh, rip a uh, rip the DRM off of of a ebook and make it into an audio book. Things like that. Little uh, little uh, pro tips. So help you uh, can read a university press book while you're washing the dishes. Uh, Patreon.com says left reckoning for that. And you just see that DRM floating out into the ocean. Exactly. Freedom. Folks, see you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! Nightmare! Bring back DJ Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psycho. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflakes says what? 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 All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are black, black. Africans are black, black. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Blast. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am in total.
We are back. It is the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure we're going to take phone calls. I don't know that we'll have time for it today. If we do, I will take them uh, in a bit. Let's just start off with what's it going to take on the I am. That is the I am moniker this person has chosen. What's it going to take? Sam, you inbred goober. You look like Rick Moranis's underdeveloped twin. Now, I'm no fan of YouTube censorship, but I don't understand why they don't blur your deeply unfortunate face simply as a matter of public health. We all love to see Emma's take on the day's political issues, but why must we have to do so while being visually assaulted by the deep fried Snickers bar sitting to her left? Because as sure as your high school nickname was Squirrel Dick, none of us need to look at a half melted mannequin head popping out of those Kmart clearance soft collared shirts you're so pitifully proud of there but for the fucking grace of god anyway i love the show and just wanted to ask what really happens when we die well of course i appreciate the question uh it's one of those eternal questions no one really knows i do although although we have a good sense of some stuff not all of it right we know that the body deteriorates rather quickly you're down to just your bones and um over enough time that even goes away yeah and as far as consciousness goes it'll be a lot like before you were born yeah very similar very similar and anybody who who has other any other information regarding that please feel free i will Happily issue a correction. This is one of those classic would love to be wrong situations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Teenage Mutant Ninja Tort Lawyer, have you all commented on the news from a couple of weeks ago about one of your sponsors, ExpressVPN? Even Snowden warned users to stop their service. Oh, I had no idea about that. Had you heard anything about that? I did not know. But did Snowden warn about ExpressVPN specifically or just VPNs generally, I wonder? We'll look into that. I had no idea about that. Chris from VA, Boys Chat Friday. Valley Girl, YouTube having issues. It keeps dropping every few seconds. Is that right? We haven't heard that. Fierce Deity, Chuck Schumer, best punting performance since the Pats in their 13-3 Super Bowl win. Jack Doberg, hey, MR crew, was wondering if you guys plan on doing a segment on the recent Steven Donziger ruling as he was just sentenced to another six months in prison. I have seen very little coverage of this in mainstream media and hoping uh, you guys get the message out. The UN has made an official statement condemning it, but our elected officials have not responded. Huge fan and new member. Thanks for the content. You should go back and watch our interview that we did with Don Zinger. Uh, I guess it was three months ago. Maybe it was May. I can't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, I'm going to dig in. Like, I, you know, I'm waiting for someone who like is knowledgeable about this stuff to write about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm looking for like... Yeah, like, I mean, the people who have done like a lot of work on this, like Will Meneker, just interviewing on Chapo, for instance. It's not like somebody's, somebody hasn't done the I want someone, I want a prosecutor or I want somebody or like a defense attorney or somebody who, who comes out and says like, this is... To really talk about the the like, how does this happen? How does a a court deputize a prosecutor? It just seems in a criminal proceedings. I just don't understand how that happens. Or maybe this is a civil case. Left-handed stranger. Uh, but yes, we will do more coverage of it. I don't understand. Yeah, how we uh, we did a little bit on left reckoning on Wednesday, actually. I mean, it's just crazy, like the way that. The, the initial complaint about forcing, like suing Donziger, and I, I don't know the, like the extent if it was a civil case or not, but after he'd won the judgment saying, we're actually going to sue you now and you have to submit all of your stuff to discovery. Like that seems like very obviously not only going after Donziger, but sending a message to any other uh, yes. uh, lawyer who would do anything against an oil company. Exactly. Left-handed stranger. I don't understand how Chuck Schumer is able... Uh, um is able to brush his teeth or tie his shoes. Republicans, please, blah, 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 help me act in good faith, blah, 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 blah. Um, Penny from New Mexico. Sam, could you please do a show that goes in-depth on the debt ceiling, the myths around it, and why it's okay to eliminate it, and what the effects would be? 
the, there wouldn't be no effects. We've already spent the money. The, the only effect, I guess, there would be... There wouldn't be an effect. I mean, um, it, it is a, a mechanism that is designed to reiterate that we're spending too much money. Um, and that is always the case that the message is supposed to be regardless of what the, what, what the number is. Um, the idea is that the budget basically says we're going to spend a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's not our budget, but let's just say it because I can't, I can't, I have to work with round numbers, hundred million dollars. And our revenue for the year is taken in taxes, $60 million. So we got to borrow and these, you know, the proportions aren't correct, but whatever, it doesn't matter. We got to borrow $40 uh, million. Um, but our debt is right now, you know, we have $10 million worth of debt. So we got to raise the debt ceiling to $50 million to get that other 40. We've already spent the money. We've already made that decision with the budget. And we've run through the revenue, and now we're on to the money that we have to borrow. And this is just basically saying we can borrow more. But let's be clear. We're borrowing largely against ourselves. So it doesn't matter. We don't owe the money to anybody. Yes, China has some of our debt. There's some nationals of our debt. People have bought treasury bonds from us. But we make the money. The government makes the money. So if I have a hundred dollar treasury bond and I'm like, hey, US government, I loaned you a hundred bucks. I don't know the hundred bucks they give me is like the a hundred dollar bill that has been around for 20 years, or it's just one that they printed the day before. Or if they just go, okay, we'll put a hundred bucks in your bank, and they just send a message to the bank that says, we just created another hundred bucks. And we're putting it in Sam's bank account. Like, there are no constraints outside of the context of what's happening within our, our economy for, for our ability to do that. So there is nothing. The debt ceiling is just like a fake thing. There is no debt ceiling. We could go into debt a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of debt. Now, maybe at one point, maybe... It's not impossible to imagine it becomes problematic for our, our financial system. We're not even remotely close to that point. It's also conceivable that it never does become a problem. Jennifer from St. Louis, Washington Generals for the forfeit. Yay. Hey, it's the old my, my older libertarian brother's birthday today. Could I get a sad trombone for him? <laughs> Oh, do we have a wah, wah, wah? Mom! 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 Why did you do that to me? <laughs> Thank you for... <laughs> that last... That, that part... <laughs> Reminds me that, that that slide whistle like is the most Matt Leckian sound that I think exists. Honestly, I like, that like, it, it, like when I hear that outside of the context of the show, it sounds like I'm hearing your voice. <laughs> Jennifer from St. Louis. Thank you uh, for Judy today. My boyfriend broke up with me last week because, quote, I'm too angry. So it does me good to hear another strong, smart woman who is not afraid to express her opinions. Well, it sounds like your boyfriend didn't know what he was talking about. So Bofa had to sit in on a work call today and listen to an executive tell me the difference between rich people and poor people is belief. <laughs> Took all the strength I had not to take myself off mute and scream. Sucks that I need this job. Sam, serious question. This is the one weekend a year that I'm allowed to go to a strip club. What? <laughs> <laughs> why, why this one? Like October, like the first weekend second weekend in october i'm fully vaxxed but worried that this would be irresponsible any safe way to do this i mean wait what's the irresponsible part then 
if he's vaxxed? Well, I think that a breakthrough infection. I mean, I don't know. I mean, is it a lot different than going to a restaurant with the, with, with the, when you're fully vaxxed? What is the waiter doing to you at a, <laughs> uh, at a restaurant? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you wear like an N95 mask, I guess, maybe. I might put it off. I'm super curious about like the one weekend a year. Is there like a sale? Yeah, that's the interesting part. It's like the purge, but for you know, lap dance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Project uh, Projectin Shaft the World. What up, MR crew? Would any of you be willing to punch someone in the face as a means to an end, perhaps if it would save their life? To be clear, not advocating violence, but more or less understanding that it does have a place. I mean, if someone explained to me how punching somebody in the face would save their life, sure. I, I could also probably come up with other reasons for punching somebody in the face. Yeah, even ones that aren't sort of fully rationalized in that yeah. such a way. Stop the meal. Have you covered the right-wing reaction to Garland saying the DOJ will investigate the death threats to school board members over critical race theories? It's being framed as Garland promises to crack down on parents who protest CRT, which is absolutely bonkers. Well, there's a, there's a huge conflation right now between the idea of protest and the idea of an assault, <laughs> right? I mean, like, like, can we like maintain that there are different, um, different things here? Like, um, here, here is Martha McClellan with the Hoover Institute fellow, Victor Davis Hanson. What else is that deal with Victor David Hansen? Let's play this clip. Uh, filming somebody without their permission in a bathroom, and then they followed her onto a federal, I mean, a flight under the jurisdiction of the Federal Aviation Committee and kind of hectored her in the, in the past. So is there an FBI investigation under no, that standard absolutely. into who's been following uh, Kristen Cinema no. on, onto a plane? And there was no, there was no FBI F investigation when they you know, surrounded Rand Paul and his wife after the State of the Union and really almost endangered their safety. Nor when Jeff Flake was a senator. Remember in the Kavanaugh hearing, they trapped him in an elevator? And so I, I think people are saying the FBI has been weaponized and the way the Pentagon has been weaponized, the way the CIA, and there's kind of a revolt against these unaccountable uh, appointees or lifetime bureaucrats that are exercising power as legislative, judicial, and executive all in one. You know, I also think of, of Antifa. Um, there was a question yesterday at this hearing about whether or not Antifa is uh, also being investigated because, uh, you know, everyone can protest in this country. Antifa has a right to protest. These parents have a right to protest. You don't have a right to burn down buildings. You don't have a right to uh, endanger people's lives. Yeah. But the, the Department of Justice has to be consistent. And, and I go back to when Merrick Garland was yes, nominated by President that. Obama um, for the Supreme Court. And it was this, you know, huge dispute <laughs> because uh, Republicans denied him a hearing, which is a separate issue. Um, but, but he was presented as as this person who was so unpolitical, so middle of the road, right, yeah. and that it was egregious to not give him that hearing because he was such an even-handed jurisprudence advocate. Yeah. Um, but so now I'm just wondering, where are the other commensurate investigations that would also Girl, fall into the same category? They're not there. Girl, he was never... He was never... There's a couple of things that people should remember. One is... Um, there was absolutely no threat whatsoever issued or I think even implied by the people who were reading off these written statements about their immigrant status. The threat was we're going to try to replace you with a different representative next time. They didn't even say that that much. And the woman on the airplane was being so polite that the stewardess was like, did you get everything you needed? <laughs> Is, are you looking for peanuts? But, I mean, put aside that aspect of it. You don't think that people who uh, were in any way protesting or violent during, like, any of these, like, over the summer were visited by cops, were arrested by cops? What, like, excuse me? The DOJ didn't have to do sh anything. Were swooped in on by U.S. Marshals? Because they, had they tried, they would have had to fight their way through four different layers of cops. 
to get to uh, those people. And this is, uh, let's be clear, the Department of Justice is going in and doing this because this is also probably a function of, like, race. Like, I think that um, everyone understands that when you're accusing people of pushing um, critical race theory in an elementary school or junior high or wherever it's supposed to be, when clearly that's not happening, it's just people are discussing racism or race or the Civil War, uh, the DOJ wants to step in because they're noticing that maybe the states are not doing anything. There's an absence of anybody standing up for these people not to get harassed on what ultimately is racial grounds, right? But it really is fascinating. Um, and, and it's a good example of what Garland should be doing, not less of, but more of. Make Martha McClellan have to spend her entire show talking about the different investigations that the DOJ is up to. That's what I think. There's plenty of stuff to investigate. Um, Rob from Albuquerque. Saying hello, Tushy, is a movement partner is really searching for the bowels of humor. Thank you. JP from Philly. Ounce of Keef. Could make a sandcastle with that. Well done. <laughs> Michael Tracy fan, Emma said she had a boyfriend yesterday, but we know that can't be true because Sam hasn't tweeted about how delightful he is. <laughs> oh, God, that's great. Fake news. I didn't even need to consult any experts. Oh, God, that's good. Nerd Cheetah, I guess I'm wondering if you have your head stuck up your ass, if you actually believe that it's Democrats' ineptitude that either dilutes or eliminates some of the potential gains we could be getting out of our elected officials. Um, I, I mean, I'm hoping that there's a third option here. I prefer the network of consequences concept. The Democrats have the power and the tools, but only talk a big game, failing to play big. You know the hope and change strategy. Think Obama's legacy concerns him when he's windsurfing, wine sipping, and breaking ground on his gentrification project? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm critical of Obama, but who are the, the Democrats? Like, it's just the, you know, Mitch McConnell is uh, getting criticism. I don't know how meaningful it is, but he's getting some criticism from some of his fellow Democrats, from some of his fellow Republicans for not allowing a filibuster on the debt ceiling. Um... Now, maybe that's all just kabuki. They're just really good at theater. Or maybe they all have, like, uh, they have different constituencies and feel they need to play to different audiences. And um, they have to, uh, you know, some of them, I'm sure, are sincere because they're lunatics. But I think a lot of them are, like, this is the role that I play to maintain my power. Um, I don't know what... You think Chuck Schumer's, you know, incentive structure is or what he wants. I don't know that if you think that, like, Chuck Schumer's sitting there going, like, if there is a um, home health care credit or something, you know, like, I, I just don't think that Chuck Schumer's interests, that the $3.5 trillion bill or whatever it is, run contrary to Chuck Schumer's interests. I, I, I just, I don't, I, I think as long as, you know, Investment bankers are, are okay with something. They don't have a dog in this fight. I think they, I think Chuck Schumer's fine, frankly. You know, you fund Israel and you uh, don't uh, regulate uh, Wall Street too much. I think Chuck Schumer is, he's going to do with whatever, like, it. you know, there's, a, there's enough pushing for. Um, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Your idea of what politics are, Um, I, I just don't know. Like, yeah, Obama ran on, and there were plenty of people who are saying, this guy is not an ideologue. He is not, he is not, when he says change, he's just really talking about himself on some level. Like he's, he's representing 
change that you know America could elect uh, elect a uh, a black guy named you know Barack Hussein Obama. Um, do I think that Obama's legacy concerns him when he's windsurfing, wine sipping, and breaking ground on his gentrification project? Yeah. Why do you think he's breaking ground on that gentrification project? Do I think he would give up his home for his legacy? No, but I think he feels like he doesn't need to. Do I think that these people operate exclusively on their uh, their legacy? Some. Some, well, not exclusively, but some uh, weigh it pretty heavily. Others, probably not so much. I, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be relevant to the situation here. I think Chuck Schumer wants to stay in office. And I don't think that he feels too much of an investment in, in this bill, other than we've set it up as a marker. If it passes, we win. If it doesn't, we lose. That's, I think, what it comes down to. So much so that they don't even know how to, to operate ha helping them win. Like, I just, w like, where is the necessity? W show, me the po show me the point where Chuck Schumer would have been punished if we had a 2.5, we started with a $2.5 trillion bill. Like, uh, there's well, something not, that's much that, less ambitious. If that happens, he's not going to be, right? Like, if we do get to a $2.5 trillion bill, he's not going to be punished for that. I think people would be pretty much okay. They've set up a situation where people would be pretty much happy with that. I think he, they, people would have been happy with it if it started at 2.5. Yeah. Well, you know, what? that's just a number. And it's just like, you know, our expectations were set. There were certain policies that people want. I just think that like all of these like um, multi-layered chess games that they had to play for them not to be inept, but rather like we're going to pretend to be inept. I mean, I think that they get to the point where like we're going to protect the fig leaf that we have, the filibuster. Not all of them want to do that. Less than, than used to, more than want, uh, more than used to are willing to get rid of it. There's certainly some who hide behind it, and so they don't want to really get rid of it, and they sort of like, well, you know, they'll, they'll nod along with it uh, unless they feel like it's really in danger. But I think like this whole concept that they are, you know, that they're so sophisticated and so coordinated that they can all pretend that they're inept, when the easiest answer to understand is they're inept. Yeah. Like, well, and they don't have the will to actually address this problem either. This problem we all saw coming with these senators. There's no, like, um, mobilization for what we do now. And I think the, pro the problem I see, because I think this is it's true, like, the it's lazy thinking to think that this is just all puppet string and choreographed. Yeah. Um, the problem, like, I think what this shows and the benefit of, frankly, having them in power to demonstrate this is that it's a part that's too corrupted by money to actually pass this stuff. And uh, they don't have a positive... Uh, Bernie has a way to try to like um, discipline the party, but other than that, there's not a whole lot of action on it. I mean, the only the only sort of like even answer theoretically provided by Bernie was he was going to reshape the electorate, and that the 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 coalition of people that made up the Democratic Party and would vote for Democratic politicians would be different enough that it would constrain, it would change, it would shift the nature of of the kind of votes the, you know uh, of of the behavior of the politicians but then you look like a guy like Manchin, and it's like well he's getting those people <laughs> he's getting the same people who bernie wants and it, and it it it's not helping with with how he is is directed um all i can tell you is that when we worked at air america we had people who would write in and go like there is a mole there because you guys are doing such dumb stuff. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. There has to be someone deliberately throwing the place. And I can tell you, I remember, I remember this is where it all really became clear to me. Saying to myself, this is a completely rational <laughs> assessment from outside. But from the inside, I can just see it is just a bunch of fucking incompetent people trying to make sure their ass is covered and they don't lose their job at any expense. And if somebody comes in who is a threat to their job because they actually do their job well, 
I used to watch this all the time. We had some people who came in who, like, on a management level, were like, wow, this guy's good. He wants to turn all the salespeople to be on commission. Uh, and, you know, not totally, but, like, they, he wants to incentivize uh, these people. Or this guy hustles. He's here until he's here at 7 in the morning, and he doesn't leave until 5 or 6 at night. He wants to make this work. That's the guy the other guys go after and try and undercut. And it's not because they had a political agenda. It's just like <laughs> incompetent and good at covering their ass. That's it. Um, oh, Fox and Friends getting feminized. Fem Friday on Fox and Friends. Ainsley Earhart, Steve Ducey, Rachel Campos Duffy are talking about the supposed mass exodus from public schools because, of course, people are trying to mask kids. There's plenty of, uh, oh, it's the weekend crew. There's plenty, plenty of evidence that shows that masking kids in schools diminishes the rate of transmission of COVID. Not, is it, is it massive? No, maybe 10, 15, 20% difference but multiply that times a bunch of schools it makes a big difference but play this you got a forum i'm getting a standing ovation as you just heard after calling for a mass exodus from public schools this as republican senators push back on the doj for looking into threats against school officials warning it appears to police the speech of parents who have a First Amendment right. And here to react I'll pause is the pause for a second. I just want to pause it for a second. First off, I don't know why you need to call for a mass exodus of public schools. You want to go to private school, go ahead. It's not like there's like there's some law that says you can't uh, go to private school, you can't homeschool. But it's a public school. There's a responsibility to everyone there. And I like how they're like down that their Chiron says DOJ threats and they're talking about First Amendment. Like these, you know, these are you're threatening school board members. We just played the clip yesterday of protesters harassing parents walking their kids home from school saying, You're propagandized. Like how are you propagandized if you move the school your child attends, maybe disrupt all of those friend relationships that they have because of your mask politics or vaccine politics but it's also like wait so you're going in and you like w the conservatives now are promoting the idea that one people can tell other people exactly what their kids need to wear to school continue this if we're looking into threats against school officials warning it appears to police the speech of parents who have a First Amendment right. And here to react is the Fox and Friends Weekend crew, Pete Hegseth, Rachel Campos Duffy, and Will Kane. Good morning to all of you. I, I see what's going on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Rachel, I'll start with you. You have nine children. The school system really affects your life. How, what's your reaction to this? Oh, she's 100% right. We need a mass exodus from the public school system. But I have a warning. We should not leave without taking our money. Uh, remember, our exactly. school systems are sp funded by our money. And so what we need to do is set as pass laws that uh, attach our money to our child so we defund children, our child's education and not these corrupt systems. Mm. She's 100% right. The tentacles are deep. I think it's really hard for us to get into teachers' colleges, which are funded by our public dollars. Um, but this is really important. I want to leave with one thought before I hand it, hand it off. This is by design what's happening to our children in these schools. Vladimir uh, Lenin said, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. This is what they're doing with our children. It's up to us to remove them from this corrupt system. And, and Pete, she makes a good point. Uh, you know, if we're gonna pay these high taxes locally to pay for schools, our money should be attached to our children. Well, all right. So first off, um, I, I, I mean, if we could get Lenin to teach in all the elementary schools in the country 
Yeah. That would be pretty sweet. I don't know about other schools, but North Dakota, we didn't have a lot of Leninists in either my elementary, my middle school, or my high school. Yeah, that's exactly what you would expect a Leninist to say about that, too, wouldn't you, though, right? You would you would hide that fact so that it could spread maybe, like a demon maybe seed. Maybe Mr. Pins was a Leninist. I don't know. Uh, the other part is, I think they have a good point here. The way that we tax and fund schools should not be local property taxes. We should be doing this on a federal level. Um, I can't, I think they're conflating like masks and CRT or whatnot, and it's all leading to the same place. What a coincidence. Voucher system. That is what they want to do. They want to destroy public education. It has uh, been a, a staple in this country really since Reconstruction. And it is no coincidence that one of the first things the radical Republicans did following the Civil War as, an, as a way of attempting to create a more equal society, a more egalitarian and fair society was to create public schools, or at least to, I guess, to, to uh, promulgate public schools. And it is no coincidence that the right today attacks public schools for that very reason. I mean, we already have, even within public schools, a two-tiered system. And uh, because of the way that we fund it with property taxes. And, and I would say also the way that, I mean, it sort of depends on the locale, but the way that people cluster there is an attempt and in, in new york city and de blasio it's a little late in the game but de blasio is attempting to sort of like try and um desegregate the schools i think it says a lot that this sort of the covid anti-school board stuff has a lot in, uh, the same vehemence as the uh, crt um school board stuff it's almost like they're just looking for a reason to attack these things of course of course. I mean, there was a time where it was like the school board was sacrosanct. Oh. Peachy Keen, AMR crew, it's finally spooky season. I want to know what everyone's favorite horror movie is. I need some recommendations. I'm just not a big horror fan. Man. You were watching that series, though, right, that you like? I, I, I enjoy it. There's a there, there's a little bit too much monologuing going on in um, uh, Midnight Mass, the Netflix show, but it's pretty well done. Uh, I think The Haunting of uh, Hill House is a really good uh, uh, horror TV show. And um, as far as movies go, I'm trying to think of what I've really liked lately, but um, there was one that came up called, I think, Host, um, which I thought would be cheap but because it, it's like a pandemic era one where it's all on Zoom. Um, a kind of gimmicky, but I thought they really uh, executed it well. Interesting. For me, the scariest movies are just like when Saul says, like, I want to watch a Jim Carrey movie. <laughs> That's when I get terrified. Um, they are really upset about the debt ceiling uh, raise. I mean, it's just amazing how like this whole fictional thing. I don't know. Should we play Lindsey Graham or Stinchfield? All right, here's Stinchfield on Newsmax. Now, Newsmax is not uh, One America Network, which apparently was like completely constructed by AT and T. They uh, yeah, I saw that they the AT and T's defense was like um, we saw that we had, we had like seven liberal networks and only one other one because of Fox News conservative network, so we had to invent one. But I want to know what those other liberal networks are. Like counting like CNN. Yeah. Yeah. They're counting CNN and MSNBC and Fox and, I mean, excuse me, and ABC and NBC and CBS. Um, and they decided we need a uh, one that's going to appeal to conservatives, but it's really like we're just going to make up news on it. I mean, well, that's how you appeal to conservatives. It really is uh, stunning. Speaking of which, uh, here is um, Grant Stinchfield on... Uh, Newsmax complaining about the debt ceiling. This is just, okay. You see, failure to raise the debt ceiling is actually about defaulting on future 
obligations, not the current ones. It means you can't buy anything else. You can't spend more. So goodbye radical infrastructure bill. Goodbye Biden spending free for all. The admission that the default threat is fake news is even buried in the White House's own website. I found this today on it. Quote, once the debt limit is hit, the federal government cannot increase the amount of outstanding debt. Therefore, it can only draw from any cash on hand and spend its incoming revenue. Pause it right there. I want that debt. back up on the thing. Do you like how stupid is either Stinchfield or does Stinchfield think his audience is? Very stupid. Let's be clear. Once the debt limit is hit, hit the federal government cannot increase the amount of outstanding debt. In other words, our budget's been passed. We are, once we set the budget, we have committed to expending, let's just say, $100 million. Let's say our revenue for the year is $75 million. Let's say we have a debt ceiling of $40 million, and we already have $15 million in it, so we need another $25 million. But the debt ceiling hasn't been raised. Keep that up. Keep that back up. Keep that back up, please. So you cannot increase the amount of outstanding debt. Therefore, it can only draw from any cash on hand. Okay, well, we had saved uh, $5 million and spend its incoming revenues. Well, annually, that's going to be $75 million. Uh-oh, we're going to be short $25 million that we've already committed to. Yeah, it does mean that we're going to default, not just on future. I mean, I guess it's all future because somebody could come in and say, like, hey, I want you to cash in my treasury bond. Uh, we don't have any cash. We don't have any cash. Well, that's a future obligation. No, they're all future obligations, you ding dong. <laughs> Current debt isn't affected, only increases of it. So what better way to balance the budget than turn off Washington's financial fire hose? It needs to happen, but Mitch McConnell is too scared of the political ramifications to do what is right. We do have promised future obligations, like bonds that needs to be paid, so we pay those first, then Social Security, then Medicare, Medicaid, and if we need money, to pay those already promised, not new, already promised future obligations, then simply do away with lots in government. How about we do away with the departments that we do not need? We start with the Department of Education, move on to the Department of Commerce, Department of Environmental Protection, <clears throat> and yes, even the Department of Energy. Just wipe them out. That takes care of much more than $100 billion alone. And states should be handling... Pause it, pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. First off, we could probably come up with a number as to what the, those departments... And, and, you know, we get over the, um, the constitutionally mandated uh, census that comes out of commerce, which is really basically all they do. Um, but does he actually think that that's going to... Um, that but we get rid of those departments? We're gonna, that's all the money? We're going to save all that money? Doesn't mention the Pentagon, though. 100 billion. No, not the Pentagon. Notably, not that department. If you want to go fishing, buddy, go for the, go for the place where all, the, where all the fish are. Is there any more to this? It's like five seconds. It's, just, it's all just like... Uh, and what are the political ramifications? There's no other ramifications, according to this dude. Well, then why... What, like, what, what, is, what is Mitch McConnell afraid of? The political ramifications? Isn't that kind of his job to care about that? But I'm but but my point is is that like what political ramifications? If there is no actual actual material difference, the debt ceiling does not get raised. The next day we cannot pay our debts on any new whatever whatever mechanism that whatever like sort of like straw man he's created. If that doesn't have any implications, then what are the political implications? There's not a lot of people out there going, 
Mitch McConnell's not paying, uh, you know, not didn't raise the debt ceiling. And the next day, nothing happened. And so we're mad about that. There's no political uh, implications unless there's some type of material implications. God. I don't know how people who watch World Net Daily or Newsmax or whatever the hell it is, how they even have the ability to turn on a TV or find it online. I honestly think if you ask them, they would say it'd be a political problem because the media is owned by liberals who would manufacture it into a crisis when it's not I see. really one. Why aren't they doing that now? So, all right, do we know who this Vernon Jones guy is? He's like one of, he was like a, like a Trumpster, right? But he's a Democrat. Yeah, so, he's a, he's a, yeah so he was a, he's a state legislator in Georgia, um, but he's like, he's like an arch conservative who, uh, who fashions himself as a Democrat, big Trump supporter, big Trump surrogate in Georgia. Now he's running for governor. And so there was some talk that it seemed like Trump was going to endorse this guy, right? I mean, wasn't that what was happening? Because all the other local sort of MAGAs in, in Georgia were behind this guy. And this was a way, apparently, to sort of like, um, we're going to put up a, a black candidate against Stacey Abrams. Isn't, is, that, is that like the idea, of MAGA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, AP News, September uh, 2nd, 2021. Trump backs Jones in Georgia, renews support for Walker. So, yeah, he's backed him. Well, that may change uh, because apparently... What they have found, and I don't know. Like, I this is one of those things where it's like, I don't know if it's true. If it is true, then maybe I like it better. Uh, maybe I like them better. But this is supposedly they have found uh information on Stu Peters TV. I don't know what that is. Like, this is the host of Stu Peters. Um, that Vernon Jones and, and Stu Peters is a you know classic Republican conspiracy theorist. Apparently, there's a lawsuit filed against Vernon Jones saying that he discriminated against his white employees when he was the county commissioner of, of DeKalb County. Unforgivable. And uh, now I don't know what to believe here, but I don't care. <laughs> I, I know that's the one thing I did not want to hear from Vernon. That, hey, wait, discriminate against, against white who? people? Hold on. Sorry, I What were the results of the vote in DeKalb? Slow down. Say that one more time. Discriminate <laughs> against white employees. What, what are you thinking? What is, okay, play this. This is pretty funny. It's completely false. It's erroneous, oh, it's really? reckless. And that's oh. why I just said, when you when you try to be holier than now that, oh, you're different from everybody else. No, you're not. Okay. You're here with a bunch of foolishness. Now, let's really? get to the next question, because sure. I'm going to talk about okay. the They're issue. They're lying. Really hey, this, okay, this, this is what I, I love about that. Keep, keep that up for a moment. I want to look at this screen. So, um, uh, Stu Peters is going in on uh, Vernon Jones. It's just so funny because Stu Peters is an interesting looking guy. Yeah, I was gonna say like the best thing about this is that like have absolutely no stakes. Want both sides to lose, and uh, and that's what's happening. But what I am struck with like look at the look at the palette of that like that that screen. I mean, a short of like a Stu Peters, um, you know, sartorial uh, things. Although you know, he's, he's like Chris Cuomo, he's got a little Chris Cuomo quality to to like what he's wearing. I would I, the tie sort of takes that out of there, but the um, but anyways, um, that looks like real television. Like I mean, like if you're like an old person and you've been watching CNN for your whole life or whatever it is, you look at that and you go like, this must be like CNN. I mean, that's the value of doing that kind of stuff. That's the value of that. It makes people think it's real because that's just the way, that's just what's happened. Oh, he's, he's got the Capitol building behind him. He must not be, you know, getting information from beam to him from like a transistor radio on the, on the bottom of a UFO or something. But here they are. Vernon Jones is really taking exception to this. V Stu, I thought you were different. The chat points out Stu Peters is very close to stupider. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start from the beginning. It's completely false. 
It's erroneous. Oh, it's really? reckless. And that's oh. why I just said, when you when you try to be holier than now that, oh, you're different from everybody else. No, you're not. Okay. You're here with a bunch of foolishness. Now, let's really? get to the next question, because sure. I want to talk about the issue. If they're that lying and if I'm foolish, then why Georgia? the 11th Circuit so let's Court talk about appeals... illegal immigration. No, no, no. Let's talk about you're the not audit. Gonna, you're not going to avoid the let's real talk questions about... here. You're not going well, to avoid well, the real questions. You're accusing me. You don't want to talk about real issues, and you want to talk about You're accusing them of lying, news, and you're accusing you me of being talk foolish. About Iran you're accusing them of lying and you're accusing me of being foolish. Just, if there was shocking you. evidence of an overt and unabashed pattern of discrimination in your administration. <laughs> yes, absolutely he did. That's what bullies do. That's what bullies do. They gaslight, <laughs> shout you down, lie incessantly, avoid the light of truth from being shined on their dark corruption. And he didn't want me to get to the facts. He knew what was coming, so I had to mute him, and he bailed. And if all of those people, his victims, were lying, then why did U.S. District Court Judge Bill Duffy say that the case against him was so clear-cut that if the jury had ruled in his favor, he would have thrown out the verdict? It was that clear that Vernon Jones was the, quote, architect, according to circuit court documents. Vernon Jones was the, quote, architect. I don't feel strongly enough about the truth of this uh, argument to do any research regarding it. I, uh, my greatest interest is about the political uh, implications of it. And the only thing that I could say in terms of my assessment of the political implications of that uh, back and forth, positive. Absolutely. Positive. I hope it stays opaque as to what the uh, truth is, actually. Yes. So it's, it becomes more of a... <laughs> it becomes more of a that. thing. <laughs> I like the idea, like, that's a bully right there. As soon as I muted him and wouldn't let him speak and talked over him with the help of my technology, he just ran away. That was bizarre, because I feel like the alpha conservative would be like, that's a coward. But calling him a bully and saying he's gaslighting? I know Why it. Why move into this register? He was pulling me, he was bullying me around, and I had to use the light of truth to shine it on him. That was, I like that. I like that. What, what, shine, I, I don't know how he exactly fr phrased that, but I'll give me some of that going. Get that light of truth, shine the light on the dark corruption that is taking place. Um, dark corruption. Dark corruption. Yeah, that dark, dark, dark Don't corruption. Don't want any of that dark corruption in the right. Republican Party. We're going to shine the white light of truth <laughs> on that dark corruption. Uh, wow. Geez. All right, folks, going to just read some IMs. Wrap things up for the week. Bear at home, me too. My YouTube connection is fine. Can you touch on Florida passing New York State in COVID deaths? I mean, just horrible. Um, it's always snowy in Iowa, uh, uh, Ottawa. All this kabuki theater around the debt ceiling and the infrastructure agenda got real old when the Democrats' similar, similar, similarity self-negotiated down the ACA 10 years ago. Center libs love thinking they're the masters of 3D chess, like there's some type of warped version of the West Wing meets Queen's Gambit. Except the maneuvering is more like the parliamentarian cower. Actual lives are on the line, indeed. Uh, Rotin Helped Pig, your favorite topic of vegan plant-based is the healthiest diet, most environmentally sustainable. Anyone who says otherwise has an agenda, but also the least harmful for animals who live tortured lives and painful deaths in factory farms. Wyoming Ryan, mansion and cinema are causing more than angst. These people are passing, on, uh, passing legislation that will save lives. It's far more important than causing some small pain in my daily life being harassed should be more of a thing the reason why everyone whines when harassment is in the in the restroom is going on is because it's effectively publicly and privately for these senators honest abe hey just wanted to add a comment about yesterday's show i found it interesting that yang says we should take ideology out of the political decisions and opts for numerical solutions reminds me of what alex Ho hokel said about the end of history being in naturalized politics where ideology is settled and all that's left is to make technocratic tweaks. Thanks. That's Ying. 
Also, as to the bathroom sort of safe space thing, if I was a sender, I would uh, just hook up a porta potty in the back of my uh, truck and just travel all everywhere that way. You can do that wherever you want. Uh, majority Report wardrobe coordinator. I think Cinema's obstruction is over some personal petty grievance. The only time she's di uh, deigned to address anyone is to make sure they addressed her by her proper title. She's like a Trumpian level narcissist, and she doesn't like that she's getting drug all over social media. JJ Cool. Hey, Sam, I have to disagree with your position about Liz Warren snake emojis. I think people should remember her conduct during the primary for one main reason. Overthrowing the established order is going to require a huge number of people unified against big moneyed interests. Bernie came close, but still wasn't enough. I understand Warren wanted to win, but if she doesn't recognize the challenges of actually taking power, that's a problem. Oh, I totally agree. I, I mean, I like her stance on, um, on antitrust. She has been... The most vocal person, I think, probably in the Senate about antitrust. But her sense of politics, I think it was, uh, I mean, the, the one thing that became very clear to me during uh, the election was that she doesn't seem to understand politics, like, for lack of a better term, retail politics. And I don't mean like the performance of it, but the idea that you need to have popular backing. I mean, she, look, just strictly from the perspective of Elizabeth Warren's perspective, and I think it's perfectly legitimate for Elizabeth Warren, I mean, I would prefer it wasn't the case, but I think it's perfectly legitimate for a politician to be like, I only care about my, like my success is the primary, you know, driver. That's, I think, predictable, right? And I think you're actually sort of, it's a mistake to expect anything more out of politicians, regardless of who they are. I'm not saying they don't exist, but it's pretty rare, and it's rare enough that it's not worth, like, assuming that. It's Bernie. Right. But if Elizabeth Warren wanted to be vice president, the smartest thing for her to do, and I said this at the time, and I still believe it even more so, the smartest thing for her to do would have been to endorse Bernie Sanders. Because when she did that, she would have been able to go to Joe Biden and say, I can deliver you Bernie Sanders people. You don't have to deal with Bernie. And she would have been able to de deliver or Bernie, or at least make the argument. That's she thought the dynamic was the same as it was in 2016. She came very close to getting Hillary Clinton's uh, vice presidency, or she certainly wanted it would have been very hard to, for, for there to be two women, I think. But, but she was seen as somebody who had not control, but was representative of Bernie's people in 2016, because to a large extent, Bernie's people were at least part her people before he ran. And because she didn't have to do anything, I think that Bernie's people would have been happy in 2016 if Elizabeth Warren had been uh, made vice president. I actually think that maybe, maybe um, Clinton would have won. But put that aside. She thought 2020 was the same as 2016, and she didn't realize that her power came from being associated with Bernie. Or forget Bernie. Being associated with the, the Bernie's voters. Yep, the movement. The movement. She didn't understand that. Very good, I think, in, in um, personal politics, but not so good when it comes to, you know, politics that are people facing. And that was the most disappointing. There was other things that she did that I just thought were really, regardless of what Bernie said to her in a closed door meeting, and I suspect that he probably did say, I don't think a woman can win this time around or whatever. The, the the way that she should have played that was I would never I'm not going to comment on this I would never talk about what somebody said to me in private and then everybody would have assumed that she's protecting him any negative uh, politics they wanted from her and they wanted uh, you know they wanted to develop around Bernie would have been developed but she would have gotten credit for defending him it's like a humble brag they blew that too. Big time. Big time. So, um, 
She can do good things in the Senate, but let's remember the importance of unity. If Bernie and Warren's positions had been reversed in the primary, there's no way he wouldn't have dropped out to support her. I'm not 100% sure of that either, to be honest with you. I think, you know, I, 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 individuals have their own thing. I don't know. We don't know. We can't make that assessment. But the bottom line is, it was not, it was contrary to her best interests to not have supported him. Abhishek, QAnon turning on Michael Flynn is genuinely one of the funniest stories I heard today. I know we got we got to go in on that Monday. Uh, apparently he's like the devil. A square. Sam, you've noted this before. For those who don't have experience in corporate world, this lack of strategy and competence we see in the Dems is endemic in corporations and leaders stay around for years. It really is. I mean, I see it, you know, to the extent that I have any uh, contact with corporate uh, America these days. I see it. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, champagne commie, a death is the transfer of the soul from one body to another, or in cases when a man is fully awakened from one body to the body of the whole universe. Okay. Link, please. Uh, Guactoberfest, those conservatives are such wimps. All right, two more. Mayberry Fryer Kowalski, I don't think any of my tax dollars are going to prop up these godless Catholic schools, just as I'm sure these godless Catholics don't want to have their money going and propping up our Protestant schools. And that's how you destroy the United Front against public school. Yes, that's true. Um, uh, let's start funding those madrasas. Jay Shivone, Stu Peters has got to be a made up name. Why not Stu Petist? That would be his, uh, those would be his viewers. And the final I am of the day of the week thank you Brad. sammy key how much of anti-vax stuff do you think is simple allegiance to trump 60 percent some of it was pre-existing but i would say 60 percent bradley matt emma in abstentia great week guys see you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, no.